very big news uh, if this indeed is the case. Evgeny Prigozhin, of course, uh, was exiled to Belarus after that march on Moscow uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and we can bring in our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, who can give us more detail on this. Uh, Diana, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, I understand you're joining us on the phone uh, regarding this breaking news. We know very little at the moment, Diana, but if indeed uh, this is the case, this is very big news indeed. Yes, I mean, I wish I could give you more detail. I think that everything to do with Prigozhin ever since his uh, a, a public emergence as the leader of um, Wagner Group has been uh, extremely murky. And of course, ever since his um, march on Moscow in June, there have been questions about whether he could possibly survive having essentially stood up against the regime. Only yesterday, we were talking about video of him popping up in what appears to be the Sahel um, in Africa, talking about how uh, Wagner forces would um, bring freedom to the African people. Uh, and today, we understand from the Russian Aviation Agency that a plane um, has crashed north of Moscow uh, in the Tver region, a private Embraer legacy plane, uh, and that all on board, all 10 on board are dead, and that Yevgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. So, I mean, I think it's very convenient for the Kremlin and for Russia to declare him dead. Um, I suppose that a lot of people have been wondering, anticipating whether uh, this would happen. Um, and these are very preliminary details, as you were saying. Uh, but if this is the case, that Yevgeny Prigozhin has been killed in a crash... Um, then that certainly serves the Kremlin's purposes because he was not particularly useful to them, having essentially created the biggest problem for Vladimir Putin's presidency, you know, that I can remember in the 23 years that Putin has been in power. Um, and it is pretty extraordinary, but we await more detail. Yeah, and as you say, Diana, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, certainly there is no love, love lost between uh, Evgeny Prigozhin and the Kremlin uh, since that uh, rebellion uh, when he marched on Moscow with uh, Wagner fighters uh, in uh, response to what he believed was bad handling of the war in Ukraine. Uh, he then supposedly did a deal with Vladimir Putin and agreed to be exiled to Belarus. Uh, and, of course, it now seems that he was on a plane uh, in Russia heading uh, from Moscow from St. Petersburg. Uh, it certainly does seem an extraordinary turn of events. Was there any indication that Evgeny Prigozhin was in Russia? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, the, the last thing we saw of him, as I said, was video of him in the Sahel, and I think it was pretty clear that that was video of Prigozhin. Now, we don't know exactly when that was taped. It was probably pre-recorded and possibly released on the day that Sergei Lavrov was in South Africa for the BRICS summit um, as an attention-grabbing mechanism. So it is perfectly possible that Prigozhin could have returned back to Russia having recorded that. I, I, I have no doubt that the man in that video in Africa, and it, it was pretty clearly, you know, a a African territory, um, was Prigozhin, but that's not to say that he hasn't returned. But um, the Russian Aviation Agency and the Russian Emergency ministry, uh, ministry telling us that his name was on a list is, you know, I mean, it's it, it, I, 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 at this stage, I would take it with a pinch of salt. We need slightly more confirmation than just that. Um, uh, as we have done really with everything to do with, with Wagner and its leadership and its relations with the Kremlin. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty extraordinary. It's pretty um, convenient, as I'm saying, for the Kremlin if he has died. I think a lot of people have been questioning how he managed to uh, survive so long, having done what he did, having been declared a traitor by Vladimir Putin, who... Um, more than anything, despises traitors, uh, and yet he was seemingly allowed to get off scot-free and um, go to Belarus and then on to, um, uh, to, 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 to Africa and deploy Wagner forces further in Africa, as he has been doing for quite a long time. 
um, you know, if this is a coincidence that Prigozhin was on a plane that crashed by accident outside of Moscow in the Tver region, well, that's pretty extraordinary. But um, there is a lot that is extraordinary in Russia at the moment. And of course, after Evgeny Prigozhin's actions, Diana, where he did uh, try and uh, create this rebellion uh, earlier in the summer, how damaging was that to Vladimir Putin? And do you think it was uh, perhaps, a, you know, a matter of time before Evgeny Prigozhin uh, saw some sort of uh, retaliation from Vladimir Putin? Not that there's any suggestion that that's what this is, uh, but certainly there's been a lot of speculation about what would happen to Evgeny Prigozhin uh, after uh, his rebellion. Yes, because I think that it showed Vladimir Putin to be vacillating and weak, and it showed up his security services not to have seen the threat that Wagner represented, despite the fact that Prigozhin ranted and raved on social media for months on end, talking about how the uh, Russian army was, uh, and the Russian army leadership was not doing what it should be. You know, you get fined here for, and jailed for discrediting the Russian army, and yet the head of Wagner was able to do it consistently over and over again on social media. And no one seemed to warn the Kremlin that he was planning to um, take over Rostov-on-Don and then send his troops north towards Moscow. And um, surely that that is exactly what uh, a security state should be able to warn its leadership of. The Kremlin has suggested that they did have some advance warning of the mutiny, in which case why on earth didn't they do something about it? So all of those things don't look very good for uh, Vladimir Putin's leadership. And I think that... Um, Part of the problem was that he has often sort of uh, followed through with a with a divide and rule kind of a policy, whereby he actually thought it was better to let Shoigu and um, the, the the defence minister Gerasimov, the head of the armed forces, and Wagner uh, leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, sort of fight each other, and 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 he could rule supreme over all his squabbling, um, you know, underlings. Now that clearly wasn't the way to handle um, a pretty dangerous man. And let's not forget, Prigozhin was once a criminal himself. He has um, uh, built up a, a trolling operation, a mercenary operation, uh, which has been extremely lucrative. He has dealt with his uh, enemies in an incredibly vicious uh, fashion. His forces on the battlefield took massive losses, but also dealt with uh, treachery amongst their own, you know, by... by, by killing people with um, uh, w with axes, I mean, and sledgehammers. This was not a man that you should um, treat with kid gloves. Uh, so it was extraordinary that um, after this mutiny, he was effectively pardoned. His business dealings were uh, dismantled to a certain extent, but his operations in Africa were, were, were allowed to continue. And Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus orchestrated this uh, sort of miraculous exit plan for him to Belarus. Um, but it would appear uh, that that stroke of luck for Prigozhin has run out if, if uh, what the Russian Emergencies Ministry is saying is in fact the case. Diana, I'm just going to update any viewers who've just joined us. You're watching the News Hour here on Sky News. Uh, we have this breaking news coming out of Russia that a business jet en route from Moscow to St. Petersburg has crashed, killing all 10 people on board. That is according to Russian emergency officials. And we're, we are hearing all this news via Russian state media at the moment, who are reporting that Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group, was on board that plane that has crashed in a region north of Moscow, killing all 10 people on board. And as I've just been discussing with our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, Evgeny Prigozhin was, of course, uh, the leader of that mutiny uh, against the Russian government, the defence minister and Vladimir Putin earlier in June. The Wagner mercenary group, of course, have had fighters uh, in Ukraine for some time, helping the Russian army with the war in Ukraine. Uh, and in June, Evgeny Prigozhin led 
a, a march on Moscow of, of Wagner mercenary fighters uh, in response to what he, what he viewed uh, as the bad handling of the war by the Kremlin. Well, Diana, let's just bring you back in, if I may, uh, an update uh, from you on, on what more you can tell us about this breaking story. Well, I mean, there isn't that much information apart from the fact that, according to the TASS news agency, the governor of the Tver region has taken personal control of uh, the investigations of this plane crash um, in which 10 people have died. Uh, the plane was a civilian one. We understand that it was an Embraer Lexi private plane, 10 people on board, um, and that all 10 were killed. Uh, and from what we understand from the emergencies ministry, or in fact the Federal Air Transport Agency, Yevgeny Prigozhin was among those uh, killed. Now, Yevgeny Prigozhin's private jet has been tracked quite extensively over the last few months, and we'll have to look into whether this was in fact that same plane or a different one, in which case why was he flying on a different plane? We understand that it was en route from Moscow to St. Petersburg, which is essentially Prigozhin's sort of home base where he's built up his business empire and where he hailed from. But, of course, he was, um, after the mutiny on June the 24th of this year, he was effectively exiled to Belarus um, under the uh, mediation of Alexander Lukashenko, the Belarusian leader. And um, and the last thing we saw of him was a video uh, in um, what we understood to be the Sahel. He appeared to be, anyway, in a desert context in Africa, saying it is uh, plus 50 degrees where I am and Wagner troops are here uh, to secure, essentially, the freedom of the African people and to make um, ISIS and other terrorist organizations in in. Uh, in, uh, on the African continent, quake in their boots. That was essentially the message that we heard from him yesterday morning. Now, that might have been pre-recorded, um, uh, and he might uh, well have come back to Russia. But if indeed it's true that uh, the Wagner boss, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is amongst those passengers killed in this crash, then that certainly provides a convenient solution uh, for the Kremlin to a man who had become a huge problem for them, I think, and From who uh, showed up the, 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 the weakness in Vladimir Putin's leadership 23 years into his rule and a year and a half into this war, which certainly is not going particularly well for him. OK, Diana, for now, thanks very much. Do stay with us, Diana. We'll come back to you shortly. Uh, but now let's just cross to Mark Voyager, who's joining me on the phone from Poland, uh, former special advisor to the US Army. Uh, Mark, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, extraordinary news. Uh, of course, we are wait awaiting confirmation. All this information that we're getting at the moment is from Russian state media. But if indeed Evgeny Prigozhin has died on board this plane crash in Russia. That is indeed very big news. Absolutely. Um, and good evening, Sally. Thank you for having me. Well, of course, we don't know exactly what has transpired. Um, it remains to be seen. And as you mentioned, this is Russian media um, outlet uh, information. However, we should uh, not forget that um, the uh, uh, disappearance and, uh, and and the removal, let's put it this way, of Putin's... Um, um, some of some of Putin's most avowed enemy over the years, both uh, Russian and international, have been linked uh, or, or to suspected um, air, aircraft crash, crashes. Uh, General Lebed in 2002, the highly popular um, governor of the Krasnoyarsk, uh, died in a mysterious uh, helicopter crash, um, uh, and he had, had, was running for president uh, before that, and he was criticizing the Chechen war uh, that Putin had started, the second one. Uh, then the, the president of uh, Poland, together with over 90 Polish uh, uh, officials in 2011, uh, the crash near Smolensk, uh, which also some in the West link with uh, uh, Putin. So, um, you know, it would not be a surprise if Putin has, has uh, yet again chosen his um, a, a tool, a method that provides some plausible deniability, obviously, a, an airplane a cl cr uh, crash. Um, and of course, this uh, leaves the question uh, what to do with uh, Prigozhin's empire. Uh, first of all, his operations that have been moved to 
Belarus, uh, but also his vast empire and, and interests across uh, most, you know, a lot of uh, the African countries, uh, not to mention his financial, of course, assets. Uh, all of these need to be uh, taken under control uh, by the Kremlin. So by the follow-up steps of the Kremlin and and the uh, and the Putin's regime, we'll, we will know, uh, you know, to what extent they knew about this, to what extent they were prepared. Uh, you know, we'll see how quickly they'll assume control over what uh, uh, Prigozhin was uh, uh, in control of. Now, Mark, of course, it, it's too early uh, to know or to say what, what could have happened here. Uh, but if indeed uh, this is true, if, that Evgeny Prigozhin has died on board a plane crash inside Russia, of course, following that uh, attempted mutiny back in June when he did a march on Moscow with Wagner fighters uh, in response to what he saw as a, as a mishandling of the war in Ukraine. Do you think that US intelligence will be able to see before long exactly what may have happened here? Oh, I'm sure there, I mean, there are, there are uh, satellite overflights, Im imagery, uh, you know, I would imagine, um, you know, first of all, there will be some sort of uh, obviously top secret uh, uh, records, uh, um, you know, signals intelligence. But some somebody somewhere will uh, uh, will probably talk. Uh, maybe a defector. Uh, maybe um, um, maybe conversations will be intercepted. Uh, but as I said, you know, uh, apart from these direct methods, uh, you know, just by the speed uh, and by the decisiveness for which uh, the Kremlin would step in. And move into to um, uh, assume control of Prigozhin's assets, if that indeed is true, we will be able to judge to what extent they knew in advance. I mean, the, the Russians, the Russian, the Putin's uh, regime, and to what extent they're prepared to uh, effectively re replace Prigozhin, because that's not going to be uh, quite easy, because his fighters uh, are answerable and loyal uh, primarily to him, if not only uh, to him. Uh, I see information in the Ukrainian media that his second in command uh, uh, by the uh, is has been has been uh, also killed uh, Dmitry Utkin uh, by the code name uh, or a AKA uh, um, Wagner. That's where the name Wagner came from. So we, we're talking about the potentially the removal of the command uh, structure, at least the upper echelon of the Wagner. So who is going to assume control of these uh, uh, ragtag mercenary uh, troops that you know that don't that don't like to follow uh, the proper military orders? So you know, uh, difficult times are ahead of. I would say, um, anyone who tries to control them. Uh, we'll see how also it transpires in Africa, uh, what transpires, and to what extent uh, the African operations will be affected by potentially this uh, uh, demise of, uh, of the uh, Wagner leader. Mark Voyager, we really appreciate you coming on uh, to discuss this breaking news with us. Thank you, Thank so, you so much. much. So much. Mark Voyager, their former special advisor to the US Army. Well, we can speak now to military analyst Sean Bell uh, about this breaking news. And of course, if you're jo just joining us, a reminder that we are hearing via the Russian Civil a Aviation Authority uh, that Evgeny Prigozhin was on a list of passengers on a plane that has crashed in a region north of Moscow. Uh, all 10 people on board that aircraft are said to have died. And this is all from the TASS uh, news agency at the moment, which is Russian state media. We are seeking to verify this ourselves. But in the meantime, let's speak to Sean Bell. Uh, Sean, of course, this comes after that attempted mutiny uh, by Evgeny Prigozhin and his Wagner fighters, or led by Evgeny Prigozhin uh, with his Wagner fighters back in June, uh, a move which uh, presented the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin's power uh, since he uh, took office. Uh, your thoughts on this breaking news? Well, Sally, um, we've been talking about uh, Prigozhin for well over a year now. And after that abortive coup, I don't think any of us expected Prigozhin's life expectancy to be more than, I think we predicted three months. It looks like it's two months. And... Uh window it was an air crash i think um he left a legacy um after that abortive coup one would have expected president putin to act very swiftly and decisively but probably because of the influence that Brogozin had not only as an oligarch but also as the leader of the wagner group um it, it, absolutely putin would not want to make a martyr of him and therefore there was a bit of tap dancing around what to do with um yevgeny Prigozhin, what to do with these Wagner fighters, um, because 
you know, Putin bluntly, his military has not delivered many battlefield successes. It's the Wagner forces that have. But all of a sudden, if you're dealing with mercenaries, you are dealing with a very difficult band of folks who are largely only interested in money. I think what we're seeing now is that uh, over the past couple of months, we've seen gradually uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin's uh, business empire gradually broken apart. Um, some of it's been bought off him, some of it's been taken off him. We've seen the Wagner forces, some of them assimilated into the Russian military, some of them uh, sent off to Africa and some of them left in Belarus. And inevitably, that was clearing the decks ready for uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin's departure. Um, uh, the only question in my mind is why he didn't see this coming. Uh, he seemed to be still remaining in circulation. He turned up at the, if you remember, the Africa, Russian Africa conference only a few weeks back, uh, seemed to be on the same stage as uh, President Putin. And yet, uh, what it appears now very clearly that his card was marked, his days were numbered, and it's no great surprise that he's uh, met an untimely end. We're just hearing from the Associated Press news agency that uh, the jet belonged to Evgeny Prigozhin. That is according to unconfirmed media reports we are getting via the Associated Press. Uh, and we also are hearing that the, the plane crash took took place 60 miles north of Moscow. Uh, now, of course, uh, the future for Evgeny Prigozhin certainly uh, seemed unclear after uh, that attempted mutiny back in uh, June, Sean. I mean, there was a lot of speculation that he could meet an untimely end, but many felt that he could have also been protected simply uh, by uh, the power and, and influence that he has uh, not least within the Wagner Group, but, but also the war in Ukraine. Yeah, there's a couple of points there, um, Sally, you know, one of which, after that abortive march, you know, he let's remember that Yevgeny Prigozhin um, used to be a hot dog salesman on the streets of St. Petersburg, and um, he spent, he had spent some time in prison, um, but a chance meeting with um, the President Putin uh, meant that over time he became his chef and and then the, the two of them saw a very prosperous future because the businesses that Yevgeny Prigozhin started, he won contracts directly through his patronage of President Putin. So it's their mutual benefit, that friendship. Um, and almost certainly that's why the Wagner Group of mercenaries, you know, the Russia has used those not only in Ukraine, but around the world with some influence. It, it was no great surprise that Brigozin, um won the, uh, the support and admiration of President Putin. Unfortunately, as ever with these things, sometimes the egos start to get in the way. Um, the rot started to set in when it was evident Prigozhin was able to deliver battlefield successes when General Gerasimov and Sir Guy Shogu, the uh, main army boss and the defence secretary of Russia, uh, were not able to deliver that. There was friction because they felt threatened. They stopped giving weapons and arms to Yevgeny Prigozhin. That meant Prigozhin started to become a lot more vocal about his criticism. I don't think his words were ever criticising uh, Putin directly, but more the frustration that they, Russia was involved in a war, and yet it appeared to have incompetent leaders in charge. But of course, Prigozhin just didn't know when to stop, and that ego rapidly ran himself into trouble. Who knows why he stopped his abortive uh, attempt on Moscow. He got some way up the M4, not to Bristol, but towards Moscow. And whatever happened on the phone call between um, the Belarusian leader and Prigozhin, it dissuaded him from marching further. But it does appear that from that moment, his card was marked. And it's really just a matter of time. I don't think this was about uh, any doubt on uh, Putin's behalf. In fact, Putin was criticised by many parties not dealing with Prigozhin a lot earlier. And almost certainly the reason he didn't do that was Prigozhin had become a very powerful figure. You know, Prigozhin marshaled the forces in Africa, which is very lucrative, not only in mercenary fees, but also in some of the influence that they have over some of the resources in Africa. And uh, Putin needed him. And the challenge was how to wean off that need before you could deal with the problem that was Prigozhin. Um, but as to his actual demise, you, you talked about the potential 
of this flight. We don't know enough about it yet. You know, it was uh, in Moscow airspace. It had a number of other people on board. It was owned by Prigozhin. But please uh, call me a cynic, but these grey hairs come with, I don't believe in coincidences. It's no coincidence that within a couple of months, within a matter of weeks of that abortive coup, Wagner's uh, influence on the world has been decreased. Yevgeny Prigozhin has found himself increasingly isolated. And here we are reporting on his apparent demise in a crash. It does appear that the problem that was Prigozhin has now been solved by President Putin. And Sean, we're hearing from Russia's civilian aviation regulator that Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. However, it's not immediately clear if he had boarded the flight. But there are unconfirmed media reports that this aircraft that's crashed belonged to Evgeny Prigozhin. Now, of course, Sean, we saw Evgeny Prigozhin in a video uh, a couple of days ago, the first uh, sighting of him since that attempted mutiny back in June. Uh, he was seemingly in Africa in that video, although that is also unconfirmed. And here we are now, a couple of days later, hearing this news uh, that he was on board a plane inside Russia. Does that surprise you? Not at all. Uh, several military analysts, when we were watching that most recent video that you referred to of him in Africa, described it as almost a final act of desperation. Uh, he seemed to be trying to um, market the wares of the Wagner Group. He was seemingly trying to drum up um, some customers for his wares. There were reports that Wagner had had to reduce the salaries available because Putin wasn't paying for them and Prigozhin wasn't able to subsidise them. And it was almost trying to drum up support. Uh, in a way, that seemed a little sad. And he was doing it out of the country, almost in direct competition, because we also understand that the Russian MOD was also out in Africa at the same time, also trying to drum up support for them helping with some mercenary or at least military training and forces. So in a way, Prigozhin's sort of desperation to survive and hopefully keep his Wagner mercenary group alive by supporting Africa and potentially the very lucrative contracts uh, out there does appear to actually have been the final straw. And the very fact that he felt comfortable uh, operating in Russia, he, if he was in his own jet, that would probably have been a, a degree of comfort around his security. But bluntly, I know it's easy to say with hindsight, but Sally, we've been talking about him for some time. It is no great surprise to see that for him, the war is over. And I'm in a way, just surprised it's taken this long. OK, Sean, do stay with us. Uh, we'll give you a breather. Thank you very much indeed for now. Do stay on the line. Uh, let's just uh, bring in Christopher Steele now, who formerly ran the Russia desk at MI6. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us to discuss this breaking news. You, of course, worked uh, for MI6 inside Russia for a number of years uh, before running the Russia desk at MI6. Uh, you're still very, very much uh, informed when it comes to all things Russia-related. Did you see this coming for Evgeny Prigozhin? Yeah, hi, Sally. Um, nothing like a peaceful August afternoon in Russia. Um, yes, I think we absolutely saw this coming. I think that Putin's indulgence of Prigozhin, both before and, in fact, after the coup attempt, was a was big big surprise, and also I think importantly, it was deeply unpopular amongst the the security elite around Putin. One of the things that we've been aware of for some time is just how divisive a figure Prigozhin had become amongst the elite. Uh, he spent most of last autumn trying to topple the governor of St. Petersburg, which of course is Putin's hometown, Biglov, um, and failed, and to take over the economy there. And then we hear source reporting telling us that Nikolai Patrashev, for example, who is a very powerful figure in the regime, Secretary of the Security Council, uh, was a sworn enemy uh, of Prigozhin. So I think that in a sense, this isn't a surprise. I think it would be a mistake to jump to the conclusion that it's an operation that was um, launched and, and, and authorized by Putin himself. But certainly, I think it looks as though it may well be um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard 
some weeks ago from a source that a contract had in fact been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business community. So I think there'll be quite a lot to, to play out here, yeah. For anyone just joining us, uh, you're watching the News Hour on Sky News. Uh, we are covering this breaking news coming out of Russia that 10 people have been killed in a private jet crash north of Moscow. The Russian Civil Av Aviation Authority is saying that Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list uh, reports also that everyone on board has been killed. Uh, Christopher Steele, uh, I mean, this mutiny that we saw back in June, we discussed this together at the time, and, and it did present the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin since he came to power more than 20 years ago. There was a lot of speculation at the time uh, that Evgeny Prigozhin would meet an untimely end. But many also thought that he might be pr protected, given his power and influence when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Um, what is your take on all of that? My take was at the time that, that Prigozhin thought he was indispensable to Putin because of his foreign ties and all the wealth and so on in Africa that he was controlling, much of which the elite needs to evade Western sanctions. Uh, and it looked for a while as though he was actually um, indispensable to Putin in that regard. But of course, I think he's been behaving quite provocatively by turning up at the Africa summit and things like this. And I, I just think that, it, that in Russia, um, these things have a habit of, of biting back. And um, yeah, as I say, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that this has happened. But I think whoever was behind it, this may be more complicated than some... Putin ordered state operation. I think we just have to wait and see. Okay, Chris, do stay with us. We'll cross back to you uh, in just a moment. But we, we're just going to bring in our... Oh, we'll speak to our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magni, in just a moment. Just a reminder, though, for anyone joining us here on the News Hour, 10 people have been killed in a private jet crash north of Moscow, according to the Russian Civil Aviation Authority. They've also said that the founder of the Wagner Mercenary Group, Evgeny Prigozhin, was on the passenger list. And we are hearing that all 10 people on board were killed, according to Russian emergency officials. All this news coming from Russia's TASS news agency at the moment. We are seeking to confirm it ourselves. But let's just bring in our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, who joins us now uh, from northern Russia. Uh, and Diana, uh, this plane crash, uh, we understand, took place in a region around 60 miles north of Moscow. What more can you tell us? Yes, we understand that this was an Embraer business jet uh, setting off from Moscow to St. Petersburg from the Russian Aviation Authority. Uh, they say that Yevgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. There were 10 people killed. Three of them were crew members, seven who were passengers. We have unconfirmed reports um, from various social media channels, one of which the grey zone is associated with Wagner, that also Dmitry Utkin, who was his uh, number two, um, who in fact the whole Wagner organization was named after because of his um, fondness for the German composer was also killed. But that we can't confirm and we don't actually know whether Prigozhin was on this plane apart from taking the Russian uh, authorities' word for it. But certainly what we can say is if it, what, if it is the case, um, then that is uh, remarkably convenient for the Kremlin, for whom I think Evgeny Prigozhin, ever since June the 24th, and really when he uh, launched his men on Moscow, but really for quite a while before that, because of the storm that he was kicking up about the way that the Russian army was being run and the, the way that Russia's special military operation was being run in Ukraine, um, as they love to call it, he had become a major problem for Vla Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, I think a lot of questions were being asked ever since the mutiny as to why on earth he had managed to um, stay uh, in public. I mean, you know, we understood that at a certain point uh, he went to Belarus, as had been mediated by Alexander Lukashenko. Then he pops up at the Russia-Africa Business Summit. Then all of a sudden video appears two days ago of him uh, in the Sahel, or what appears to be the Sahel, but it certainly looks like it's Yevgeny Prigozhin and he looks and sounds like he's in Africa. Um, it may have been pre-recorded. And now we have this news. Um, and certainly uh, Prigozhin did not seem to have learnt his lesson 
uh, after the mutiny. He continued to say that the special military operation Russia's war in Ukraine was um, being badly run. He continued to feel free um, to mouth off on social media. Um, and so the question is, or, or was, you know, what would happen to him? Um, and if he was on board this plane, well, there you have your answer. There are also uh, unconfirmed reports, and I think we will get a lot of this um, now on Russian Telegram, uh, which is very busy, uh, that uh, the, the plane was shot down by Russian air defences. Now, that's perfectly possible. We're never going to get uh, official confirmation on that, but also um, it may not be the case. I think we're going to get a great deal of speculation across um, uh, uh, the media, Russian Telegram, and the media more broadly as to what on earth happened. But, um, you know, we wait to see uh, whether we can really confirm that Prigozhin... Uh, has indeed been killed. But if he has, is, this is a, a, a major moment, really. This was a man who um, had done a lot for the Kremlin over the past 10 years. Uh, his m mercenaries first started in Ukraine after 2014, um, when Russian proxies were operating there to try and um, push through this war against uh, Kyiv. Uh, they then went to Syria, um, working alongside Russian forces, facilitated by Russian forces there to try and keep um, the Syrian president in power, uh, whilst at the same time spreading across a number of African countries. And the deal was, after the mutiny, this a uh, very short-lived mutiny that uh, Wagner would continue its African operations. But what we understand over the last... Um, f f f okay. And I think I'm going to throw back to you. Um, we'll have more, Sally. Diana, thank you. We're just going to uh, bring these pictures coming in uh, from Russia, uh, supposedly live pictures uh, of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, who is attending a concert dedicated to the 80th anniversary of the victory of Soviet troops in the Battle of Kursk. That is the information we have at the moment. Those live pictures coming in uh, from Russia of Vladimir Putin attending a concert while this breaking news emerges that Evgeny Prigozhin may have been killed on a plane crash north of Moscow. Let's just bring Chris Steele back in, uh, who ran the Russia desk at MI6, uh, for more on this. Now... Uh, Chris, of course, uh, that march on Moscow and that mutiny that we saw led by Evgeny Prigozhin back in June did pose a real threat to Vladimir Putin. How do you think Russia will react now if this indeed is true, that Evgeny Prigozhin, the head and founder of the Wagner Mercenary Group, has died in this plane crash in Russia today? What could be the impact of that for Putin? I think it works on two levels, Sally. One is what is the impact on the elite? And I think that the significant thing there is that Prigozhin was actually very isolated and very unpopular in the elite. So I, I don't think he had many allies. It is interesting, of course, that uh, Surovikin, who may have been one of those allies, the general who was commanding in Syria at one point and then subsequently in Ukraine, uh, his demotion, as it were, was announced, I think, only yesterday. And, and there seems to be a coincidence going on here that maybe this is a reckoning for those that were supporting Prigozhin, the few that were. So I don't think the impact on the elite will be will be very significant. In fact, I think it will be quite a relief for most of those people. The impact wider in Russia is more nuanced, I think. And although the Russian people seem to be quite passive, um, I think that it's very difficult to explain away the fact that one minute uh, Prigozhin was a hero who was delivering a victory at Bakhmut and so on, and the next minute he's a traitor, and the next minute he's dying in an air crash. I, I think that is quite a, uh, a dissonant um, situation to be explained in the Russian media and so on, though we'll see what they what they cook up. But I don't think his, his death, if that is what we're looking at, um, will be significant in terms of Russian elite politics, I think, because he was so marginalised. OK, Christopher Steele, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us with your thoughts. We're just going to cross back to our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, uh, for more on this. Uh, and, Diana, we are hearing from uh, the RIA state news agency that Russian emergency services have found eight bodies at the site of this plane crash 
north of Moscow. Uh, of course, we are also hearing that Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list uh, for that flight and that all 10 people on board have been killed. All this information at the moment coming from Russia, Russian state media, uh, but certainly it is interesting, if true, that Evgeny Prigozhin was on board a flight inside Russia despite being exiled to Belarus following that attempted mutiny in June. And we are hearing uh, that this aircraft may have been shot down by Russian air defences. Some very interesting detail emerging. Diana, your thoughts on all of this? Yes, I don't think we can um, confirm in any way the air defence um, line. That is certainly what's being put out there on various telegram channels. Um, but And it's a possibility. But, uh, you know, I don't think we'll get official confirmation on that anyway. Um, uh, but it wasn't really ever an exile, you know. He was meant to go to Belarus straight after the mutiny in June, um, but he didn't seem to go for quite a while. There's been a lot of tracking of that Embraer jet of his, and Yevgeny Prigozhin has used it quite a lot within um, Russia to go back to St. Petersburg to deal with his affairs there, which were slowly and steadily dismantled, um, it seems, by the Kremlin. He would uh, go over to Belarus a few times, um, and we believe that he was recently in Africa um, uh, because he released this video of what appears to be him in the Sahel um, uh, just a few days ago. But, um, you know, if this is uh, true, that, it's, uh, that it was him on board, and we're also hearing that his deputy, Dmitry Utkin, was also one of the passengers flying with him, that's also unconfirmed, but from uh, rumours on Telegram channels, then that would be um, an absolute blow to the leadership of Wagner, but one which uh, the Kremlin has essentially been trying to kind of move um, Wagner loyalists to other... Uh, arms of the Ministry of Defence. And, in fact, that was what they wanted to do um, before uh, Prigozhin launched his coup, try and get Wagner under the auspices of the, of the Ministry of Defence and not under Yevgeny Prigozhin himself. And I would agree with what Christopher Steele was saying, that this isn't going to cause um, huge ripples amongst the elites, who I think were themselves uh, discombobulated, concerned by uh, what Yevgeny Prigozhin was trying to pull off and by his extremely sort of ultra-nationalist patriotism um, that's not going to, did not sit that quietly with, you know, those uh, 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 within the elites who might have uh, not feel quite so uh, comforted by the way that uh, the war is going. Um, and Prigozhin across the whole country, he really became known uh, after the Battle of Bakhmut as a successful commander. But after the mutiny, I think his um, preliminary popularity ebbed somewhat because people felt that he had betrayed the Russian army um, um, and was a, a, a traitor, really, to what President Putin was trying to do. Um, but certainly this, uh, if it is conclusive that uh, he is killed, uh, does solve a problem for Vladimir Putin, because that is certainly what Yevgeny Prigozhin was becoming. OK, Diana, uh, thanks very much indeed for now. Let's just cross back to Christopher Steele, who formerly ran the Russia desk at MI6. Chris, of course, Evgeny Prigozhin was exiled to Belarus uh, following this mutiny in June. He then seemingly appeared in a video a couple of days ago, apparently in Africa somewhere, and now we're hearing this news that he was on board a flight from Moscow to St. Petersburg, which has now crashed, killing all 10 people on board. Does it surprise you that he was in Russia? It sort of surprises me in a sense, but this is not the first time we think he's been in Russia since the coup. Of course, there was a story about a, a month ago that only a few days after the uh, uh, revolt or whatever we want to call it, that there was a meeting in the Kremlin with Putin, which he attended with other Wagner group leaders. So that was one instance. And then, of course, he turns up like a bad penny at the, um, the Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg, uh, a couple of weeks later and is photographed with one of the leaders of one of the Sahel countries. So it is very curious what he's been up to since uh, June the 24th when this revolt happened. Um, and I think, you know, he had 
crossed a line. And, and as I said earlier to you when discussing this, um, we understood that there had actually been a contract put out on him after June the 24th, not by Putin, but by other members of the elite. So I think this was almost inevitable, I, I hasten to say. OK, uh, Christopher Steele, thank you very much indeed for your insight on all of this. We really appreciate uh, your time. And just a reminder for anyone just joining us here on Sky News, we are covering this breaking news coming out of Russia that Evgeny Prigozhin may have been killed on board a plane crash uh, that has uh, happened north of Moscow. Uh, this is all unconfirmed at the moment. This news is all coming from Russian state media that a business jet travelling from Moscow to St Petersburg has crashed, killing all 10 people on board and that the Wagner Group leader, Evgeny Prigozhin, was on the passenger list for that flight. Unconfirmed media reports that the jet belonged to Evgeny Prigozhin. This breaking news coming out of Russia that Evgeny Prigozhin was involved in a plane crash north of Moscow. We will have more on this throughout the evening here on Sky News. Was it a private jet? It's seven o'clock. This is Sky News Tonight. Our top story, breaking news. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, is believed to be among a group of dead plane passengers. Russian authorities say he was one of 10 passengers on an aeroplane that has crashed just outside Moscow. The man, once known as Putin's chef, led an attempted coup against the Russian government earlier this year. Good evening. Reports from Russia say the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, which staged an attempted mutiny against President Putin in June, was on board an airplane that has crashed outside Moscow. The Russian Civil Aviation Authority says Yevgeny Prigozhin was one of 10 people on board a private jet which came down north of Moscow. Well, let's take you straight now to our Moscow correspondent and Diana Magne. Um, Diana, of course, we don't know if he was indeed on board this plane, but he was certainly on the plane manifest, manifest on the list of passengers. Yes, according to the Russian Emergencies Ministry, um, he was on board. We understand that eight bodies have been found at the crash site, um, but we were told that 10 passengers or three pilots and uh, seven passengers were on the list of those on board. We also understand from telegram channels that Dmitry Ukin, who was essentially uh, Prigozhin's number two at Wagner, was on board. But all of this uh, does need further confirmation. It would be extremely convenient for uh, 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 the Kremlin, for Yevgeny Prigozhin now to be no more. Uh, I think he has been a massive problem for Vladimir Putin um, uh, ever since certainly the very short-lived mutiny that he launched on Moscow on June the 23rd and 24th, but also in the weeks and months before when he very loudly and publicly across uh, social media railed against uh, the way Russia's uh, operation in Ukraine was being conducted and against the Russian army leadership. Um, and Vladimir Putin came out and called him a traitor and all those that followed him a traitor. And uh, traitors are the one thing that Vladimir Putin cannot abide. And yet somehow through m miracles of mediation by Alexander Lukashenko, Prigozhin was allowed to go pretty much scot-free, seemed to have the license to travel around Russia still, uh, popped up in Belarus where he was meant to be in exile, but popped up in St. Petersburg at the Russia Economic uh, Russia Africa Summit, also held a meeting or, or was invited to a meeting with Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin five days after the mutiny with other uh, Wagner commanders. Um, but in the intervening time between that mutiny and now, uh, his operations have been disbanded.
landed. And what was supposed to happen was that he would essentially uh, keep some of his forces in Belarus, but focus his uh, operations in Africa. What we understand, though, was that the Ministry of Defence and Russia more broadly was trying in Africa to recruit um, Wagner soldiers to their own uh, ranks and essentially take over Wagner's operations there too. I think that um, for Putin, Prigozhin was uh, a, a, a pain, an embarrassment. Uh, he had shown him to be remarkably weak in the way that um, this mutiny showed up uh, Putin for not having uh, recognised that this was about to happen, for not having listened loudly enough or, or closely enough to someone who, um, more than anybody else in this country, uh, discredited the armed forces, which is something that you go to jail for. And now we have this news that he is, in fact, uh, what are we, two and a half months after that uh, mutiny, on the passenger list, supposedly dead after his plane crashed just after takeoff um, from Moscow's Sheremetyevo airport, apparently en route to St. Petersburg. Now, it's interesting because the last thing we saw of him was a video from uh, Prigozhin uh, in what appeared to be the Sahel. He seemed to be in Africa. It came out the night before last, um, talking about how Wagner would continue its operations in Africa and save the continent, essentially, from um, terrorists and gangsters at large there. Uh, and two days later, suddenly it seems he's on a plane going from Moscow to St. Petersburg, um, uh, but, but not anymore. I think there is a lot that is extremely unclear. Um, I think it will take a, take a lot of investigative reporting um, from those outfits like, for example, Bellingcat, who've managed to do uh, the really forensic stuff on, um, uh, uh, on what goes on inside this country to, to actually determine what did happen. But what we're seeing in the immediate aftermath, uh, and most of which is unconfirmed, is that um, uh, 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 Dmitry Ukin, his number two, was also on that plane, and speculation that the plane was shot down by uh, Russian air defence, all of which is unofficial. All that we can say from official Russian sources is that uh, 10 people lost their lives on that plane, it was. It came down over to the Tver region, and uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. All this, mind you, whilst the president, President Putin, attends a event to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Kursk. Um, and I think, you know, he, he apparently said no tigers, panthers and other Nazis be beasts could break the spirit of the Soviet soldiers. Talked about how proud he was of the Russian servicemen, uh, the heroes of the special operation, he said, are worthy of the glory of participants in the Battle of Kursk. Um, I'm sure he was long due to uh, make this speech but I think it's interesting that it happens uh, at the time that this news about Yevgeny Prigozhin comes out too. Yes, Diana, stay with us. One wonders whether that is a coincidence or not. Well, as Diana said, the Russian president is currently attending a concert in Kursk. Uh, these are the latest pictures from that concert. You can see him there, centre stage. It is the 80th anniversary of the victory of Soviet troops in the Battle of Kursk. Uh, Vladimir Putin pinning a medal there on a soldier and applauding. So um, now uh, let's bring in um, former Russian diplomat Boris Bondarev, a critic of President Putin's war against Ukraine. Good evening to you. Um, Unconfirmed reports that uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin is on this plane that, that has crashed. Uh, certainly, were Reuters reporting that eight bodies have been recovered. Your response to uh, the events tonight? Uh, good evening. Yeah, it's uh, it's a surprise again with Mr. Prigozhin, and uh, I see there are two options. First, he was on this plane and he's dead. And the second, of course, he was not on this plane and his whereabouts are known. Um, if he was on this plane and he's dead, that means that it, it, it benefits President Putin very much. Uh, it doesn't matter whether President Putin is Mr. behind Gondra, this. Mr. Be uh, bear with uh, us. Um, uh, as this is a breaking news situation, uh, events unfolding, we have now here at Sky News got the very latest pictures in of that crash site. Uh, I'm seeing them just as you are as this is happening. So you can see that plane crash site, uh, flames leaping from the site. Uh, Reuters news agency has 
been reporting that eight bodies have uh, uh, been recovered so far. We know that 10 people were reported to have been on board. Uh, amongst those on the passenger manifest list, Yevgeny Prigozhin, of course, the now infamous leader of the Wagner Group. Um, so these are the very latest pictures. That is on your screen, Yevgeny Prigozhin there. The last time we saw him was in a video from Africa, um, now seemingly, uh, allegedly, on a plane um, travelling north of Moscow when it crashed. And we just brought you those pictures there. So, uh, Mr Bondarev, uh, back to you now, of course. Um, uh, as you were saying, you know, the, the, this perhaps isn't so much of a surprise in the sense that everyone was wondering what might happen to Yevgeny Prigozhin after that bold attempt of a coup uh, at the heart of, of, of Russia. Yeah, sure. And I believe uh, such a response has been anticipated by many experts, uh, considering that uh, Prigozhin and his mutiny attempt uh, made Putin look weak in the eyes of his elite, people, military, you know, and Putin has uh, to respond aggressively to that in order to uh, maintain his uh, um, grip on power. And uh, he, he, he behaved, I mean, President Putin behaved during this mutiny and after behaved as a weak leader, weaker than he should have. And so I think if Prigozhin is dead by now, it will benefit President Putin and will help him to show that he's still strong, he still commands the, his uh, high authority, and any attempts against him will be punished one way or another. So it doesn't matter whether President Putin is directly behind this uh, air crash or it's just a coincidence, but he will interpret it uh, this way, of course. Right, but because I the think perspective the main thing will that, be it, that President Putin yes. has dealt swiftly with this, whether he was involved yeah. Yeah. or, or yeah. not. And, and there yes. has been a, an interesting period between that coup attempt and this crash where Yevgeny Prigozhin was, of course, sent to uh, Belarus uh, and we wondered whether that was going to be um, an attempt by Wagner to invade Ukraine from Belarus. And then, of course, we most recently saw him in Africa declaring that that, uh, the Wagner Group was going to protect Africa? Um, as, as we have all, all, all seen, Mr. Prigozhin has been full of surprises and he's a very unpredictable kind of person. So we can be 100% sure that he is a victim of this uh, air crash. And the problem is that we, we um, will very unlikely have any reliable data from Russia about this. All information is controlled by the government, so they will issue only the information they they look they see fit. So if they if they think that Prigozhin is dead and that benefits them, they will show us his I don't know remains or something. But they may say say that his um, the body cannot be identified. And so we will have some room for speculations. So I, I believe that uh, we will never, we will not have any reliable information anytime soon. Right, that's interesting. And what, what more can you tell us about Yevgeny Prigozhin? Of course, we know he was a, a relatively low-profile pro Russian businessman at one point. He, he then went to jail, came out, opened a, a hot dog stand, became a caterer and became known as Putin's chef. Well, uh, frankly, I am not a very big expert on Evgeny Prigozhin, and I just I know <laughs> what what you just listed about him. But yes, he is a very interesting uh, person in Russian elite, someone who is in, in in Putin's elite, but outside the elite. He's not in Putin's team, so to speak. He's not from uh, former KGB staff, so he is kind of a self-made man and uh, rabbit uh, dog of Putin. Who, who was used for some Putin's undercover operations in Africa, in other countries, and now in Ukraine. But, uh, well, it's 90%, uh, I'm 90% sure that his mutiny was not considered by Putin as something that can be really forgiven. 
And, and where do you think President Putin goes from here then? Would he continue using a mercenary group like the Wagner group? Um, or do, do you think he'd take a, a different tack? Um, well, it's, it's good to speculate that uh, perhaps they will try to avoid any repetition of such experience with Wagner group. So any other mercenary groups, any other mercenary units will be directly and strictly subordinated to Ministry of Defense. And it's been already done. So, uh, but anyway, there is a new legislation in Russia that a lot of uh, regional governors can now make their own uh, private uh, mercenary ar armies. So uh, I don't see that this story, particular story will have a significant impact on how Russia wages its war in Ukraine, really. And, of course, President Putin ha has precedents of being linked to assassinations and attempted assassinations. Um, uh, of course, uh, Mr Litvinenko and others uh, here in Salisbury, too. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and, we know, and this uh, air crash is, is different because all previous assassinations were made through poisoning or something or something more subtle ways, so to speak. This is very brutal, but maybe that's the response that Putin wanted to show that the brutal mutiny against his power will be brutally punished. So I wouldn't be very surprised about this. Former Russian diplomat uh, Boris Bondarev, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Well, uh, let's go straight now to uh, military analyst Sean Bell, uh, who joins us. Uh, Sean, uh, you and I have been talking about um, Yevgeny Prigozhin for uh, at least a year now when he jumped onto the scene of the uh, war in, in Ukraine. Um, and then, of course, that long-held criticism of the Kremlin and President Putin, uh, an attempted coup, and here we are today with a, a report that he is on board a plane that's crashed. Yeah, good evening, Simon. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't think either of us are that surprised that we are covering this story. I guess we'd sort of expected about three months for the dust to settle before Putin would deal with the problem that was Prigozhin. It's actually two months later. Um, and we've got to be, obviously, at the moment, well, all we know is that there's a fight with a manifest. It might well be that Prigozhin wasn't on there. This might have been an engineered story for Prigozhin to slip quietly away and live in exile um, somewhere, living under a wig and um, it, with a degree of privacy. But the harsh reality is that um, the writing has been on the wall ever since Prigozhin launched his sort of assault on Moscow back a couple of months ago. Who knows why he stopped it? But the reality is that uh, he made an, a, an attempt to, and a frustration probably about General Gerasimov and uh, Sergei Shogu, the defence minister and the, um, the leader of the Russian army, because he saw them as incompetents and that lives were being lost because of Russian military incompetence. Um, but to do that by marching on Moscow clearly was an error of judgment. Quite why he stopped, nobody knows, but it does seem his days were marked since that time, even though he has made a couple of guest appearances between now and then. But I think there's no great surprise that um, uh, he's uh, met his uh, final days and it's been quite a public um, um, departure for him. Sh Sean, uh, stay with us. Uh, we're going to bring our viewers some uh, fresh pictures just coming into us here at Sky News. If you've just joined us, there's reports of a plane crash just outside north of Moscow. These are the pictures that are coming into us, believed to be of that crash. As the plane came down and, and of course, the crucial information is that 10 people believed to be on board, eight bodies found and amongst those on board believed to be Wagner Group boss Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, 
extraordinary pictures there, uh, Sean Bell, retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, who's been uh, looking at what's been going on on the ground in Ukraine for us. And of course, uh, Sean, Yevgeny Prigozhin, really very much the mastermind of, of what has been going on on the ground uh, as leader of the Wagner Mercery Group. Yes, he has. I mean, uh, just going quickly on that video, uh, what's fascinating about the video is that um, aircraft can crash for a number of reasons. They can get lost in fog, they can run out of fuel, there's all sorts of things. Um, that aircraft, if, if that is the image of that aircraft coming down, it's not in bad weather. It's evidently had some major damage because it's spiraling out of control. There's smoke coming from it. Um, all of that would either point towards some sort of explosion inside the aircraft that has rendered it, uh, taking it out of control, or as some reports suggest, that surface-to-air missile or some sort of system has taken it down. Um, but you can see by the slightly erratic behaviour of the aircraft in fine weather, that is not a normal incident, particularly for a commercial aircraft. So there's something happened to that, either an explosion or some sort of surface-to-air missile system. But turning to your question, Simon, yes, I mean, um, in general, uh, President Putin has relied heavily on mercenary forces. They um, have delivered one of the very few successes in, over the last year in Ukraine when they helped take Bakhmut in a very bloody attritional uh, phase of the war. Um, but of course, as the Wagner Group got bigger and stronger, um, the Russian MOD got more and more frustrated and more and more intimidated. And of course, when Prigozhin started claiming that it was their incompetence of Grazimov and Sergei Shogu that was leading to the failures on the battlefield, um, he became very angry at the military leaders and by association, therefore, President Putin. Although the two of them were friends, they have uh, enjoyed a very close business relationship. Yevgeny Prigozhin has made a lot of money being the uh, running a company that only he won contracts, of which President Putin was the one signing off those contracts. But it's uh, amazing how time changes relationships and how from being an ally and um, Russia desperately needing the support of mercenary groups, all of a sudden that's transitioned to a time where Prigozhin became a threat and something that Putin had to deal with. And uh, he's had a couple of months just to gradually erode the uh, Wagner empire, er erode Prigozhin's business interests in Moscow. Some of them have been sold off, some of them have been taken from him. Yevgeny Prigozhin, last seen on video a couple of days ago, looking a bit of a sad figure trying to sell his wares in Africa in the full knowledge that actually the Russian MOD was doing exactly the same thing in competition. So I guess in some respects the writing was on the wall and it's a, a bit of a brutal end as President Putin reasserts his, his authority and power back in Moscow. Retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, uh, thanks for the moment. We will be coming back to you. Let's speak now to our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, as we show you those pictures of that plane crash that's come into us here at Sky News with reports that Yevgeny Prigozhin was indeed on the list of passengers. And, and Diana, um, I was speaking earlier to former Russian diplomat Boris Bondarev, who said um, Prigozhin is full of surprises. Uh, we're not even sure, of course, whether he was on that plane. He was certainly listed on that plane. And that is why we are being cautious uh, tonight uh, in whether we can confirm whether he is, in fact, one of the victims of that plane crash. I would definitely agree with that. And there is also discussion at the moment about a second plane that uh, belonged to Prigozhin that's been doing zigzags according to flight radar tracking systems over uh, Moscow. Um, and that has since landed at a, at a Moscow business airport just south of Moscow. Um, so speculation that maybe he was on one manifest but had travelled on uh, that plane and has landed safely. You know, we don't know. At the moment, what we have is um, Russian emergencies ministry and the Russian aviation authority saying that he was on the manifest, his name uh, was on there and that uh, all on board that plane that you saw crash died. Um, there is a lot of speculation out there on Russian telegram um, and it will continue feverishly and it will take I think quite a long time before we can actually uh, forensically investigate uh, what we have but some of the speculation involves the fact that it may have been shot down the plane by uh, air 
defence. You're already seeing um, speculation amongst pro-Russian channels that that may have been uh, Ukrainians that shot the plane down. That would certainly be a useful justification um, uh, for the Kremlin to use if they... Uh, had a hand in this, which is um, something that we won't know for some time, but would certainly make sense given the fact that Prigozhin has been such a monumental problem for Vladimir Putin, basically, for the last few months ever since he launched uh, that uh, uh, short-lived mutiny on Moscow. It is all very mysterious and everything to do with Wagner and with Prigozhin's leadership has been mysterious right from the start. But I don't think it will come as any surprise um, if uh, Prigozhin does turn out to have been killed in this crash um, because his days really uh, appeared to be numbered after he launched what was effectively the biggest challenge to Vladimir Putin's rule in the 23 years that he's been in power. And I think many, many people were surprised that he was still operating and still apparently free to fly around uh, between St. Petersburg, Moscow and Belarus and Africa um, as he appeared to be. So very interesting developments. Um, it will be difficult to uh, work out uh, the truth behind any of them. Um, but what Yevgeny Prigozhin normally does uh, if he uh, is still in the land of the living is uh, publish uh, a something, a voice message, an audio message or a, or a video message on social media. And if we don't hear anything from him for a few days, then I think we can assume that what the Russian authorities are saying is true. Or we may get some uh, proof, uh, video proof, visual proof from them in the coming hours, days. Uh, who knows? Um, but uh, it certainly does seem to be a fascinating development um, around an organisation that has really, you know, handed us some surprises, uh, Russia watchers across the world and certainly here over the last few months. Well, well, you, you're saying uh, people are watching across the world, Diane. I'm just going to bring our viewers some uh, news. Stay with us. Uh, that President Biden has been briefed on this reported plane crash in Moscow. Uh, that's coming straight from the White House. So the White House says that President Biden has been briefed on this plane crash. And, Diana, you're just saying that the world will be watching. This will have ramifications beyond Russia, of course. Well, I mean, I think the Kremlin has been trying very hard to ensure that it doesn't really have ramifications beyond Russia because they've been trying to take over uh, Wagner's uh, operations outside of Russia and ensure that there's a bit of a seamless transition from what Wagner was doing to what Russia can then take over. Um, Wagner was essentially out of uh, Ukraine, um, ousted from Ukraine. It, it, Prigozhin's forces, mercenary forces, had been very useful to the Kremlin, um, dying in vast numbers around Bakhmut. But once they captured Bakhmut, that was uh, kind of all the uh, Kremlin needed for them. In the south, uh, General Surovikin had built up this... Um, incredibly powerful uh, defensive line whilst attention from the Ukrainians and the world was fixed on Bakhmut. Um, and so when the Ukrainians launched their counteroffensive, they met a very, very stiff resistance. And what we also have uh, heard over the last few days is that General Surovikin himself, who was um, supposedly close to Wagner and um, accused of essentially having uh, known a little too much about the mutiny before it happened and perhaps not uh, passed that information on, he uh, vanished um, after the mutiny. Prigozhin was allowed to still pop up here and there, but Surovikin uh, vanished. He was head of the uh, aerospace forces here in Russia. Um, and over the last few days, we've understand, we understand, again unconfirmed from official sources, that he was released from um, detention, has been relieved of his duties. Um, but again, we haven't seen... Uh, anything from him. And it was surprising that he, a, a very top m military commander who built up that defensive line, which has held the Ukrainians at bay over the last few weeks of their counteroffensive, he seemed to suffer much more significant repercussions than uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin did until now, um, if it is indeed Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, who died in that plane crash, alongside possibly, and again this is unconfirmed, his number two, Dmitry Utkin.
Okay, Diana, thank you. Um, so, uh, where has Prigozhin been since that attempted coup that we've been talking about? Let's talk you through that. Well, here's what we know. On the 27th of June, the Belarusian leader, Alexander Lukashenko, said the Wagner boss was now in his country. He contradicted that almost 10 days later, saying Prigozhin was actually in Russia. Then a video emerged on the 18th of July of the mercenary leader apparently welcoming his fighters to Belarus. But on the 27th of July, photos began to circulate on social media, apparently showing him in the Russian city of St. Petersburg, where a Russia-Africa summit was taking place. And yesterday, a video of Yevgeny Prigozhin, apparently in Africa, was released. It was his first video address since the failed rebellion. Well, I'm joined now by military analyst, retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell. And Sean, um, uh, uh, for viewers just joining us, let's uh, talk about these pictures that have come into us here at Sky News of that reported plane crash. Um, Sean, you pointed out that it's a clear day, no reason perhaps for the plane to come into difficulties weather-wise. So talk us through what you can see and from your experience um, uh, from the military. Hi, Simon. Yeah, I mean, um, aircraft crash do crash, but generally speaking, um, they don't crash like this. This uh, is a fair weather. Um, the aircraft clearly hasn't had any difficulties with fog or trying to land in poor weather. Um, that aircraft is spiraling out of control. And right at the start of the imagery, there appears to be a couple of twists of white uh, in the sky near where the aircraft is falling from. And um, we'd have to look closely at the video footage, but if an aircraft's falling like that, either it's had an explosion which has taken off the tail plane or done some serious damage to the aircraft so it can no longer fly and is spiraling out of control, or the aircraft has been targeted by some sort of surface-to-air missile system. And at first viewing, admittedly, I'm only seeing this at a distance at first viewing, but there do seem to be some little spirals of white very close to where the aircraft might have been hit, and that is normally the telltale signs of some sort of surface-to-air missile system. Um, but again, it, it's far too early to say this is just a, a, a seasoned grey-haired veteran looking a bit of... There, there's the video footage there, and you do wonder what, what that signifies. And for me, it's either an explosion or it's some sort of missile system, and that would explain why the aircraft is spiralling out of control uh, and into the ground. Right. Uh, uh, and of course, we, we uh, don't know exactly what's happened. And, and intriguingly, Sean, we don't know if indeed Yevgeny Prigozhin was even on that plane. He's certainly listed as a passenger on it. Um, and Vlad, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, of course, uh, will have known that perhaps his days are potentially numbered. President Putin known um, uh, to deal with his adversaries uh, swiftly. Um, uh, talking to Boris Bondarev earlier too, he said that normally it's in a different way. This would be a more brutal way. We've seen him uh, allegedly behind the poisonings of adversaries in the past. Um, Let's talk about Yevgeny Prigozhin, Sean, and, and his significance in terms of the Russian military and, and in terms of the war in Ukraine, because he came to prominence initially as uh, known as Putin's chef, but in terms of a mercenary leader, it was during the war in Ukraine and, and as the leader of the Wagner group. Yes, yeah, Simon, as you say, um, I mean, Yevgeny Prigozhin's had a interesting back history. I mean, he was locked in prison for several years. Uh, he made some money selling hot dogs on a street corner in St. Petersburg. But fast forwarding through his history, he uh, founded a catering company. Uh, it looks like serendipity, the cross paths with President Putin. And actually, the two of them made some very profitable ventures together with uh, Brigozin's companies winning um, contracts when they were the only competitors with Putin signing them off. So it does appear as if they were very close business colleagues and buddies. And of course, when 
uh, Putin needed help with mercenary outfits, particularly in Africa, um, Wagner um, was born and uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin was only too happy to oblige. But of course, when the war in Ukraine came along, the Russian MOD, if you remember, was not performing well on the battlefields. The battles over uh, Bakhmut were legendary and the Wagner group really came to cro prominence there, recruiting a whole load of convicts. It suited uh, President Putin to have convicts fighting rather than um, the, the sons and uh, husbands of Moscovites. And, um, but, it, but of course, Prigozhin's frustration then at the established Russian military of Gerasimov and um, the Defence Secretary, Sergei Shogun, um, he couldn't um, hide his frustration, but, and that led to tensions with the Russian military, and of course, implicitly, not necessarily explicitly, but criticism of Putin himself. And of course, as Wagner Group grew in size, it grew in influence, and Yevgeny Prigozhin probably got a rather too big for his boots, culminating in that abortive march up the M4 towards Moscow in, uh, in June. Quite why that was stopped, uh, all sorts of theories, but it does look as if Luk uh, Lukashenko of Belarus was instrumental in persuading Yevgeny Prigozhin to stop. We're not quite sure whether that was just because he couldn't prevail, whether or not his family were threatened or whatever. But all of a sudden now you were left with the, what does Putin do with this guy who's led a rebellion? We fully expected him to be... Uh, his days to be numbered, but it was pretty clear Putin didn't want to make him a martyr and also needed to unravel some of his business interests and what to do with the Wagner group. And I think we've seen over the last few weeks, gradually Wagner, more and more of their forces have been assimilated into the Russian MOD. Some have been sent to Africa and the remaining ones sent to Belarus. And gradually Yevgeny Prigozhin's business empire has been dissolved to the point at which, as we say, the last time we saw him on the video clip you're showing now, um, looked a bit of a solitary character, almost trying to sell his wares of his Varna group. By all accounts, they've had to reduce the salaries paid because there was no money coming in. Uh, the Russian MOD was uh, advertising its own options, military options to African leaders. And all of a sudden, it felt like this was the end of the road for Yevgeny Prigozhin. And two days later, uh, we see reports now that uh, his plane, with apparently him on the uh, on, on the passenger list, uh, apparently his demise. Now, whether or not he's actually died or whether this is a very well-staged opportunity to, for him to disappear off to exile, who knows. But I have to say at face value, uh, Prigozhin owned the aircraft. Apparently there were seven passengers, the rest were crew. And you can only expect that those passengers were almost certainly uh, heavily armed members of the Wagner group who were supportive of Yevgeny Prigozhin. So almost certainly this is an act whether driven by Putin or driven by his uh, acolytes. This has solved a distinct problem that Putin's had and allows Putin now to move on. Retired Air, Vi Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, thanks very much indeed for that analysis. Uh, just got some more uh, information to bring to you that's coming into us here at Sky News. Um, uh, been speaking to the National Security Council uh, in the US uh, spokesperson, a a Adrian Watson, um, asked about these reports on Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, the answer was, we have seen the reports. If confirmed, no one should be surprised. The disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow, and now it would seem to this. So that's from the uh, National Security Council spokesperson in the United States. And, of course, just a short while ago, the White House also reported that President Biden has been briefed uh, on this reported plane crash in Moscow. So President Biden's briefed. The National Security Council says no one should be surprised. Uh, let's bring you these pictures uh, uh, that have also come into us here on Sky News as this breaking news unfolds this evening. This is of the plane crash site. That is the plane crash uh, with 10 passengers on board. Eight bodies, that's according to the Reuters news agency, eight bodies recovered so far. 10 passengers were supposed to be on board. Among those, 10, 
uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the boss of the Wagner mercenary group, working for President Putin most recently in the war in Ukraine. Unconfirmed whether he was on board, unconfirmed if he is among those killed, but a significant figure nonetheless. I'm joined by Michael Bosacu, senior fellow at Atlantic Council, former OSCE spokesperson too. Um, Michael, you, you have uh, covered Russia and spoken to us about what's going on in Ukraine uh, many times. Uh, your reaction to this, uh, seemingly perhaps, if indeed President Putin's behind it, straight out of his playbook. Sure, it, it's definitely straight out of a Putin playbook to get rid of opponents. Um, I'm in Johannesburg right now for the BRICS summit. And of course, there's going to be a lot of interest in uh, finding out whether, in fact, this was the case that Prigozhin was killed. As you know, he has, the Wagner group has deep, deep interests here, not only uh, extraction of blood diamonds and gold, but also. Um, uh, uh, an arm of the Russian uh, state security service in terms of providing security to a lot of uh, belligerents here. Um, normally, one would expect uh, Mr. Putin and his uh, cronies to get rid of an opponent through traditional means, poisoning, poison umbrella tip or cocktail. But this, if, if proven true, is very, very brazen and, uh, and probably in their minds, so what if there are any people not related to Prigozhin on board? And of course, we, we don't know if he was indeed on board, um, Michael. Uh, uh, speaking earlier to Boris Bondarev, he said he's full of surprises. Um, so we are erring on, on the side of caution tonight right. on, on Sky News, but uh, a significant figure nonetheless. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, when uh, the so-called coup was staged and then there was a disappearance for a while of Prigozhin, um, I said at the time uh, that I don't believe we would see him disappearing into Belarus and, uh, you know, driving a tractor, digging potato fields, nor would he disappear here. Um, he's been very active, uh, quite the jet setter. Uh, in fact, he was filmed uh, north of here in the Sahel, just recently uh, saying that the Wagner group is basically alive and well. So. Maybe it all became too much for Mr. Putin. Uh, two egos don't survive well in the same uh, uh, bubble. And um, my question here, and, and you're right, we have to be very careful what we say at the moment, but if uh, Prigozhin and Wagner is now out of the equation, who is going to take over that very, very lucrative business here in Africa to fund the Putin uh, war machine? I don't think uh, the Russian state security services or security services such as Gazprom, uh, a few others have the ability to do that just yet. Uh, and also an extraordinary um, play, plane crash to witness, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, at the same time, President Putin on stage at a concert uh, marking the Kursk victory, um, speaking quite uh, fiercely about uh, uh, victors and uh, adversaries. It would be uh, straight out of the Putin playbook uh, to uh, appear as if he's going about business as usual and doing other things and has nothing uh, to do with this. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, this is something in terms of what we're seeing on the screen right now, it is out of their playbook. I mean, you you know what probably came to mind when I saw this down aircraft, it was MH17. We well know the Russians have the capability of striking an aircraft at very, very high altitude as well. So uh, that would be also uh, straight, uh, straight out of their playbook too. We have to be careful again. Uh, we also have to um, remember that this also could have been promotion staging a disappearance uh, in some twisted way. So um, I, it, it remains to be seen what exactly happened here. And, and Michael, in terms of the significance of, uh, of Prigozhin vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Wagner group and leading the Wagner group, um, if indeed he was on this plane and if indeed he has been killed, uh, what, we are looking a little bit ahead here, but what, what do you think the impact will be on the Wagner group and what happens on the ground in Ukraine? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, um, what happens in Russia, if I may, I don't, I, I think actually the Wagner group um, misread Russian public opinion that they had more support than they thought when they staged the coup. Uh, I don't think the remnants of the group would be able to cause much trouble. And in terms of the war in Ukraine, I think they were mostly already subtracted from that theater of, the, of war, basically handing it over uh, to the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense. But um, I was watching the uh, Ukrainian telegram channels, as you might imagine, lots of joy and celebration of these reports. Uh, but uh, we all know how poorly the uh, the Russian military has performed on the Ukrainian uh, battlefront. Um, so it, it's, it, it's not going to help them in that regard. But what we are seeing, broadening out the picture a little bit, is uh, Russia is increasingly turning more to those uh, long-range missiles, those drones, to execute their aggression in Ukraine. And this is very scary stuff. I'm temporarily based in Odessa. We see it close up. Um, they're doing more and more of this. So now you basically have two uh, battlefronts, the, the physical one in eastern Ukraine, as well as the long-range one. Uh, and um, that's a very, very difficult position for Ukraine to be in at the moment, especially especially because of the slowness um, that the counteroffensive is happening. Uh, and, um, Michael, of course, uh, we've talked about being straight out of Putin's playbook in terms of how he deals with adversaries. He, there is also, of course, an ICC arrest warrant out for him. You mentioned that you're there in South Africa for the BRICS summit. He didn't attend uh, because uh, he, he couldn't because of the potential of, of an arrest. President Putin... Uh, whether he is behind this or not, will certainly uh, allow people to think he is because he wants his adversaries to think he is. Yeah, you know, we were watching him very closely this morning. Uh, he was on live video as opposed to recorded video yesterday. He looked, um, I have to say, very tired, uh, almost anxious or nervous. Um, his absence from here when you have his big, these big players like Xi Jinping of China, Mr. Modi of India here, um, shows uh, his increasingly limited horizons as well as his increasing uh, uh, isolation. Uh, it's not the same as uh, being here in person. There's a lot of bilaterals going on. And um, I have to say the other thing I noticed today, Simon, is that uh, uh, the foreign minister uh, of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, basically looked like a... a a, a puppet uh, sitting there not doing much. But it was very noticeable. The other thing I can tell you from being here for a few days now is uh, there is almost um, an affection for Russia here on the ground in South Africa because of the historical ties, especially with the ANC. And if you listen to South Africa media, some of it, um, they word for word report what Mr. Uh, Putin says. So that was a bit of a surprise for me. And uh, one more thing, if I can, a uh, huge amount of um, Russian media here. I was sitting right next to them, and they're basically parroting everything that Mr. Putin says. But I think um, among the African leaders, uh, especially those more to the north, uh, who have gotten used to Wagner on the ground there, this is going to be a big shock to them to, to have this out of the to have him out of the equation. Okay, for now, Michael Bossy Q, thanks very much indeed for your analysis. Good to have you with us tonight. Well, earlier, as this news was breaking, my colleague Sally Lockwood talked to Christopher Steele. He used to run the Russia desk at MI6. He said it'd be a mistake to jump to conclusions about Putin's involvement with the Prigozhin plane crash. Nothing like a peaceful August afternoon in Russia. Um, yes, I think we absolutely saw this coming. I think that Putin's indulgence of Prigozhin, both before and in fact after the coup attempt, was a was big big surprise. And also, I think importantly, it was deeply unpopular amongst the the security elite around Putin. One of the things that we've been aware of for some time is just how divisive a figure Prigozhin had become amongst the elite. Uh, he spent most of last autumn trying to topple the governor of St. Petersburg, which, of course, is Putin's hometown, Biglov, um, and failed, and to take over the economy there. 
And then we, we hear source reporting telling us that Nikolai Patrashev, for example, who is a very powerful figure in the regime, Secretary of the Security Council, uh, was a sworn enemy uh, of Prigozhin. So I think that in a sense, this isn't a surprise. I think it would be a mistake to jump to the conclusion that it's an operation that was um, launched and, and, and authorized by Putin himself. But certainly, I think it looks as though it may well be um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard some weeks ago from a source that a contract had, in fact, been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business community. So I think there'll be quite a lot to, to play out here yet. For anyone just joining us, uh, you're watching the news hour on Sky News. Uh, we are covering this breaking news coming out of Russia that 10 people have been killed in a private jet crash north of Moscow. The Russian Civil Aviation Authority is saying that Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. Uh, reports also that everyone on board has been killed. Uh, Christopher Steele, uh, I mean, this mutiny that we saw back in June, we discussed this together at the time, and, and it did present the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin since he came to power more than 20 years ago. There was a lot of speculation at the time uh, that Evgeny Prigozhin would meet an untimely end, but many also thought that he might be pr protected given his power and influence when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Um, what is your take on all of that? My take was at the time that, that Prigozhin thought he was indispensable to Putin because of his foreign ties and all the wealth and so on in Africa that he was controlling, much of which the elite needs to evade Western sanctions. Uh, and it looked for a while as though he was actually um, indispensable to Putin in that regard. But of course, I think he's been behaving quite provocatively by turning up at the Africa summit and things like this. And I, I just think that, it, it, that in Russia, um, these things have a habit of, of biting back. And um, yeah, as I say, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that this has happened, but I think whoever was behind it, this may be more complicated than some Putin-ordered state operation. I think we just have to wait and see. Christopher Steele from the Russia desk there. Well, if you're just joining us here on Sky News, here's what we know so far about this evening's breaking news. There are reports coming out of Russia saying the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, which staged an attempted mutiny against President Putin in June, was on board a plane that has crashed outside Moscow. These pictures you're seeing on your screen right now are of that crash site. The Russian Aviation Authority says Yevgeny Prigozhin was one of 10 people uh, on the passenger list on board a private jet, which came down north of Moscow. Uh, that is the crash site there. Now, uh, beyond Russia, President Biden has been briefed. That's according to reports coming from the White House that President Biden has been briefed about that plane crash. Um, reports, too, from uh, on Prigozhin from the national security spokesperson in the United States, Adrienne Watson, um, who said when asked about this plane crash today, uh, we have seen the reports, if confirmed, no one should be surprised. The disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow, and now it would seem to this. Uh, and, of course, um, uh, this is the uh, point uh, that uh, we have... Uh, that uh, Pr Pr Yevgeny Prigozhin's uh, path seemingly has led to. I, I repeat, we do not know if he was indeed on board that plane. However, he is named on the passenger list. The pictures you are seeing right now coming into us here on Sky News tonight as uh, uh, the story unfolds uh, of a plane crash north of Moscow is of that plane tumbling down through the skies. Uh, let's turn and to now and bring in military analyst Sean Bell. Um, Sean, you're a retired Air Vice Marshal. Uh, talk our viewers who may have just been joining us about these pictures um, of uh, 
of the plane crashing and, and what you can see from it, of course, uh, early reports and, and uh, not entirely clear pictures. Yeah, good evening, Simon. Yeah, it, 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 on, on the basis that we obviously don't yet know exactly what we're seeing, but uh, given the reports of a plane crash, if this is the plane crash, then plane crashes traditionally are either in bad weather, the pilot struggling to find an airfield, crashes into the ground or whatever. Um, this aircraft looks as if it's completely out of control. It's spiralling down. There are vapour trails coming from it, all of which indicates that it's had some sort of catastrophic failure in the air. And if you look at the footage, right at the start of the footage, in the blue sky beyond where the aircraft was, there's a couple of squirrels, little squirrels of, of white, which are indications um, of a surface-to-air missile type of threat. Now, these might have been perfectly natural, um, but we're looking for clues as to why this aircraft would have tumbled down. That would almost certainly be either some sort of explosion in the aircraft that either took out the tail or took out some major flying controls, or it was targeted by some sort of surface-to-air missile system uh, from the ground. Whichever occurred, it's clearly had a catastrophic effect. There's no, going to be no survivors from that accident. So the only question then is, was the manifest correct? We certainly, at the moment, we understand that eight bodies have identified from a manifest of 10. And at the moment, there are a lot of questions about if the Yevgeny Prigozhin was actually on that flight. But it was not a survivable accident, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and as we bring our viewers uh, those pictures, uh, I want to also remind you of what our Moscow correspondent, who I've been speaking to this evening, has said, that there are also reports within Russia, unconfirmed reports of a second plane zigzagging behind the first plane. Uh, was Yevgeny Prigozhin on that, potentially? We do not know. Uh, it, it, once again, if you're joining us, uh, a plane has crashed north of Moscow. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Vargas, a mercenary group believed to be on board, or at least his name is on the passenger list. Uh, Sean Bell, re remind us of the significance of Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, as far as uh, the Wagner mercenary group, as far as Russian military, President Putin, and the war in Ukraine is concerned. Yeah, I mean, where, where do you start with um, Yevgeny Prigozhin, a sort of an enigma? enigma. He was... Um... You know, in prison for years, selling hot dogs on the corner of St. Petersburg, rose to prominence by a chance meeting with uh, President Putin and formed himself a, a contract catering company, won lots of contracts of which um, P Putin was the signatory. So the two of them became wealthy um, together and by all accounts were good friends. But it then appeared that uh, Putin needed the help of mercenaries, particularly in Africa and latterly in Ukraine. Yevgeny Prigozhin was very happy to help provide that. But it's been an interesting relationship because uh, literally only a year or so ago, um, Vladimir Putin was denying that he had anything to do with the mercenary outfits. And yet, very recently, he admitted that they were being funded uh, by the Russian MOD. And the part of the challenge I think that Putin's had is that he knows the Russian military haven't performed well in Ukraine, and he desperately needs um, the Wagner mercenary group because they were the only ones to deliver any success when they took Bakhmut. But as they became stronger, as they became more powerful, as Yevgeny Prigozhin became more and more influential, so the problem started. Also, if you use a mercenary outfit, they don't follow the rules of law. They don't follow the Geneva Convention. And their actions have, in part, led to President Putin being indicted by the International Criminal Court and being un unable to travel. So both Yevgeny Prigozhin has been a sort of saviour for Russia, but also a pariah for Russia. And of course, as he gradually got out of hand, became too verbally uh, dismissive of the Russian uh, leadership and by association, President uh, Putin, and then the final nail in the coffin was when he launched that abortive uh, march on Moscow, which uh, back a couple of months ago, his days were numbered. And the only surprise really is it's taken this long. It looks very likely that Putin did not want to make him any form of martyr. He needed to unpick Yevgeny Prigozhin's sort of business interests. He was an oligarch after all. Some of his businesses have been sold off. Some have been taken from him. And then it was a question of how do you maintain 
the influence in Africa without losing, uh, if you lose its head. And part of the Wagner Group's been assimilated into the Russian Ministry of Defense. Some of it's been sent out to Africa. Some of it was sent out uh, to uh, Belarus um, after Lukashenko offered to provide a sort of safe haven for them. And I think most recently, only two days ago, when Yevgeny Prigozhin was touting his wares in Africa, it felt like it was the beginning of the end. He was uh, running out of Wagner forces, didn't know how to pay for them, um, was ending up uh, competing with the Russian MOD to provide military services to Africa. And it is no great surprise that 48 hours later, um, we're witnessing the scenes we are, notwithstanding the fact that we don't yet know he was on board. But I'm not a believer in coincidences. It was his aeroplane. He was on the manifest and his time was up. And it seems that President Putin has finally dealt with the problem that was Prigozhin. And Sean, I want to break down um, this quote that's come in to us from the National Security Spokesperson for the United States, Adrian Watson. Um, earlier I was speaking to Michael Bosicu, um and uh, Boris Bondera, both of the same opinion, that uh, this would make, whether he was behind it or not, President Putin look strong, as though he has dealt swiftly with an adversary who, who dared to attempt a coup on the Kremlin uh, in the heart of Russia. But reading between the lines of this, of this line, and I'll remind our viewers, it says, we've seen the reports, if confirmed, no one should be surprised. But this is the interesting part, I thought. The disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow and now it would seem to this, almost turning it back on President Putin's failures, uh, calling it a disastrous war in Ukraine. Yes, there's, there's lots in there, isn't there? I, I think um, one of the criticisms that um, Yevgeny Prigozhin had was that you can't go into war half-heartedly, Yevgeny Prigozhin recruited a load of convicts to go into the war in Bakhmut, and he witnessed tens of thousands of his recruits getting slaughtered in Bakhmut. And his view was that largely that was the incompetence of the Russian leadership, and that actually they should be handling this war very differently. Now, um, President Putin clearly had his own view about how the war should be conducted, has his allies, and his number one priority, obviously, is to stay in power. But I think this whole, uh, the relationship that Putin had with the mercenary figures, um, we don't use mercenaries in this country because you, you invest heavily in your armed forces. They're professional. They are serving their country and therefore ultimately prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. Once you start using mercenaries, you dance with the devil. And uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin was invaluable to President Putin but rapidly transitioned to being a thorn in his side and a threat to his presidency and something that had to be dealt with. I think turning to your point, though, about the timing, uh, it seemed most military analysts thought that Putin couldn't just deal with Prigozhin straight away. He had to, uh, because the danger is he'd be made a martyr, and that might un make matters even worse. And by assaulting his business interests first and then eroding the Wagner Group, Gradually, President Putin would gradually erode uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin's position. The danger of that approach is he looked soft with some of the hardliners in Moscow. So the very fact that he's finally dealt with um, Yevgeny Prigozhin in such a brutal manner is probably the end that President Putin was seeking. <coughs> Uh, Sean Bell, retired Air Vice Marshal, thanks very much indeed for joining us uh, this evening. It's eight o'clock, you're watching Sky News. Uh, reports coming in to us that the boss of the Wagner mercenary group in Russia, Yevgeny Prigozhin, was on board a plane that has crashed north of Moscow. Uh, in the very latest statement coming to us from uh, the British uh, FCDO, a government spokesperson has said that they are monitoring the situation. President Biden has been told about the plane crash. Uh, that's according to the White House. Let's take you straight across now to Ukrainian MP Alexei Goncharenko. Uh, good evening to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us this evening. As this breaking news unfolds uh, of reports of Yevgeny Prigozhin on a plane that has crashed, uh, your response tonight? Hello. Uh... It's something predictable, I don't know, for the moment, is really Prigozhin dead. But if he is dead, from the first moment of the mutiny, which was exactly two months ago, interesting coincidence, right? 
Just exactly two months ago, Prigozhin uh, made a mutiny and Putin was just on the edge and, and he was very scared. And in two months, Prigozhin is uh, probably dead. It looks like Putin killed him. From the first moment, it was clear that after mutiny, the planet is too small for both of them. So um, I was sure that Prigozhin's life is in danger. And uh, now we see the development of the situation. And it can be that Putin killed uh, his former uh, hand and his former mercenary leader, which he used, but uh, he lost control of him. Are you, are you, you clearly aren't surprised and you believe that President Putin very much has a hand in this? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. And uh, if Prigozhin is dead, so this is definitely is made by Vladimir Putin in his uh, KGB style to kill his uh, opponent just exactly in two months after mutiny to show that he is still Russian emperor. Because to be an emperor in Russia, you need to show your strength. And Putin showed his weakness two months ago. But I don't think it will help. Just, just watch it. This country, which pretends to call itself one of the like world superpowers, but what the mess is going on there? Two months ago, mutiny and Prigozhin. I just want to remind you, uh, just destroyed several Russian helicopters and jets, a uh, uh, like uh, down them, uh, military helicopters and jets. In two months, Prigozhin himself is killed in the jet, and and that is the country which tries to show itself as civilized or something like this. This is a crazy country, absolutely. I am not uh, crying absolutely for Prigozhin. Today is Ukrainian National Flag Day. So it's a good present that Prigozhin, who is a killer and a criminal, who killed a lot of people in Ukraine, who killed a lot of people throughout the whole world. So he, if he is now dead, it's a good news. But who is Putin? Just imagine with whom we deal. The person who calls himself president of Russian Federation, but in reality, is absolutely butcher and criminal and murderer. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Goncharenko, uh, you mentioned there uh, that he is a killer. Uh, he was the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, which has, uh, 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 has had a significant impact during the war on Ukraine. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I think that Prigozhin deserved uh, the death and maybe now finally he found it uh, for everything he did. It's interesting what will be after, because there are also news that not only Prigozhin, but his deputy, his right hand, Mr. Utkin, who was former Russian Secret Service officer and who was a real military leader of Wagner Group, because Prigozhin uh, was never a military person, and that was Utkin who was a military leader. So maybe he's also dead. It means that Wagner Group is completely decapitated if it's true. And uh, definitely it's also the question what will now happen with these uh, five, 6,000 people who are now mostly uh, encamped in Belarus, which is in reality occupied by Russia. Some of them maybe now in, in, in Africa. The last video that you show, this screenshot on your screen, this is the video from Africa, from we don't know, maybe it was in Libya, uh, where Prigozhin was saying that we are working here in Africa in order to, to promote Russian interests there. So that's the question, what will be now with this gang of mercenaries? Yeah, and, and what is your, your concern about what happens next, uh, uh, given uh, President Putin's now seemingly dealt with uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin? For, now, for us, nothing new. Putin is a criminal. Putin is a murderer. Russia is more and more in mess. I think that soon we will have some more breaking news from Russia. I don't know what will happen. But uh, if uh, Putin is on the track to his own kind of uh, sudden death or something like this, this is how uh, Russian emperors like him uh, usually finish uh, their life. So we don't know. But uh, Russia is in very big turbulence. How it will happen next, what will happen next, I just can't answer to you. For me, the most important is that Ukraine should liberate its territories and have a fence, huge fence on the border with this crazy country. 
OK, Mr Goncharenko, thanks very much indeed for joining us this evening. Um, you. If you're just joining us here on Sky News, uh, uh, you're watching pictures right now on your screen of a plane crash um, that's happened, uh, breaking news this evening, uh, with reports that Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group, um, the Wagner Mercenary Group, was on board the plane that crashed north of Moscow. These pictures on your screen right now of that crash site, the, the flames are uh, very, very uh, f recent pictures straight after that plane crash that came into us here at Sky News that we're bringing you. Well, the Russian Civil Aviation Authority says he was one of 10 people uh, on board the private jet. Uh, what we know is that he was certainly listed as being on board that private jet. Whether or not he had boarded that plane, we cannot confirm. Um, Reuters news agency reported that eight bodies have been recovered from that plane crash site. You can see it's uh, devastated the plane. There are no nothing left of that plane there. Eight bodies recovered. That means two still left, whether those two people were on board or not. Pro and Prigozhin's private military group had staged of course, an attempted mutiny against the Russian government in June. We just heard there from the Ukrainian MP talking about the impact that would have had. Tonight, the Foreign Office have told us they're monitoring the situation closely. In the United States, President Joe Biden has been briefed on the situation and the spokesperson for, person for the National Security Council in the United States, Adrian Watson, had this to say following the news. Uh, uh, and I quote, we have seen the reports. If confirmed, no one should be surprised. The disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow. And now it would seem to this. Well, as this news was breaking earlier, this is what the Russian president himself was doing. Vladimir Putin was attending a concert in Kursk. Uh, these are the latest pictures from that event. It's the 80th anniversary of the victory of Soviet troops in the Battle of Kursk. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, appearing there, of course, uh, uh, analysts saying that is straight out of his playbook to seem, uh, see that he is uh, continuing as normal. Um, so where has Prigozhin been since uh, the attempted coup in June? Uh, what have his movements been? Let's talk you through that. This is what we know so far. On the 27th of June, the Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko said the Wagner boss was now in his country, in Belarus. He contradicted that almost 10 days later, saying Prigozhin was actually in Russia. A video emerged on the 18th of July of the mercenary leader apparently welcoming his fighters to Belarus. But on the 27th of July, photos began to circulate on social media, apparently showing him in the Russian city of St. Petersburg, where a Russia-Africa summit was taking place. And yesterday, a video of Yevgeny Prigozhin apparently in Africa was released. It was his first video address since that failed rebellion. Well, earlier I got the thoughts of former Russian diplomat Boris Bondarev, a, a critic of President Putin's war against Ukraine. I believe uh, such a response has been anticipated by many experts. Uh, considering that uh, Prigozhin and his mutiny attempt uh, made Putin look weak in the eyes of his elite, people, military, and no. all. And Putin has uh, to respond aggressively to that in order to uh, maintain his uh, um, grip on power. And uh, he, he, he behaved, I mean, President Putin behaved during this mutiny and after behaved as a weak leader weaker than he should have. And so I think if Prigozhin is dead by now, it will benefit President Putin and will help him to show that he's still strong, he still commands the, his uh, high authority, and any attempts against him will be punished one way or another. So it doesn't matter whether President Putin is directly behind this uh, air crash or it's just a coincidence. 
but he will interpret it uh, this way, of course. But right, because I the think perspective the main thing will be that it, President Putin yes. has dealt swiftly with this, whether he was involved yeah. Yeah. or, or yeah. not. And, and there yes. has been a, an interesting period between that coup attempt and this crash, where Yevgeny Prigozhin was, of course, sent to uh, Belarus, uh, and we wondered whether that was going to be um, an attempt by Wagner to invade Ukraine from Belarus. And then, of course, we most recently saw him in Africa declaring that uh, the Wagner Group was going to protect Africa? Um, as, as we have all, 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 all seen, Mr. Prigozhin has been full of surprises and he's a very unpredictable kind of person. So we cannot be 100% sure that he is a victim of this uh, air crash. And the problem is that we, we um, will very unlikely have any reliable data from Russia about this. All information is controlled by the government, so they will issue only the information they, they look, uh, they see fit. So if they, if they think that Prigozhin is dead and that benefits them, they will show us his, uh, I don't know, uh, remains or something. But uh, they may say, say that his, um, the body cannot be identified. And so we will have some room for speculations. So I, I believe that uh, we will never, we will not have any reliable information anytime soon. Right, that's interesting. And what, what more can you tell us about Yevgeny Prigozhin? Of course, we know he was a, a relatively low-profile Russian businessman at one point. He, he then went to jail, came out, opened a, a hot dog stand, became a caterer and became known as Putin's chef. Well, uh, frankly, I am not a very big expert on Evgeny Prigozhin, and I just I know <laughs> what what you just listed about him. But yes, he is a very interesting uh, person in Russian elite, someone who is in, in in Putin's elite, but outside the elite. He's not in Putin's team, so to speak. He's not from uh, former KGB staff, so he is kind of a self-made man and uh, rabbit uh, dog of Putin. Who, who was used for some Putin's undercover operations in Africa, in other countries, and now in Ukraine. But, uh, well, it's 90%, uh, I'm 90% sure that his mutiny was not considered by Putin as something that can be really forgiven. And, and where do you think President Putin goes from here then? Would he continue using a mercenary group like the Wagner Group? Um, or do, do you think he'd take a, a different tack? Um, well, it's, it's good to speculate that uh, perhaps they will try to avoid any repetition of such experience with Wagner Group. So any other mercenary groups, any other mercenary units will be directly and strictly subordinated to Ministry of Defense. And it's been already done. So, but anyway, there is a new legislation in Russia that a lot of uh, regional governors can now make their own uh, private uh, mercenary ar armies. So uh, I don't see that this story, particular story, will have a significant impact on how Russia wages its war in Ukraine, really. And, of course, President Putin ha has precedence of being linked to assassinations and attempted assassinations. Um, uh, of course, uh, Mr Litvinenko and others uh, here in Salisbury, too. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and, we know, and this uh, air crash is, is different because all previous assassinations were made through poisoning or something or something more subtle ways, so to speak. This is very brutal, but maybe that's the response that Putin wanted to show that the brutal mutiny against his power will be brutally punished. So I wouldn't be very surprised about this.
Well, earlier as this news was uh, breaking here on Sky News, my colleague Sally Lockwood talked to Christopher Steele. He used to run the Russia desk at MI6 and he said it would be a mistake to jump to conclusions about Putin's involvement with Prigozhin's plane crash. Nothing like a peaceful August afternoon in Russia. Um, yes, I think we absolutely saw this coming. I think that... Putin's indulgence of Prigozhin, both before and in fact after the coup attempt, was a was big big surprise. And also, I think importantly, it was deeply unpopular amongst the the security elite around Putin. One of the things that we've been aware of for some time is just how divisive a figure Prigozhin had become amongst the elite. Uh, he spent most of last autumn trying to topple the governor of St. Petersburg, which, of course, is Putin's hometown, Biglov, um, and failed, and to take over the economy there. And then we, we hear source reporting telling us that Nikolai Patrashev, for example, who is a very powerful figure in the regime, Secretary of the Security Council, uh, was a sworn enemy uh, of Prigozhin. So I think that, in a sense, this isn't a surprise. I think it would be a mistake to jump to the conclusion that it's an operation that was um, launched and, and, and authorised by Putin himself. But certainly I think it looks as though it may well be um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard some weeks ago from a source that a contract had in fact been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business community. So I think there'll be quite a lot to, to play out here yet. Well, I'm joined now by Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Alicia Kearns. Uh, good evening to you. Um, the Foreign Office says it's monitoring this closely. Your response tonight to reports that Yevgeny Prigozhin is on a plane that's crashed north of Moscow? Look, many people saw this coming. It is very unlikely that Putin could allow the sort of insult that the March on Moscow was to go without a response. We know that for Putin there is one unforgivable sin, and that is betrayal of him or betrayal of his Russia. And we've seen him hunt down people even on British shores, whether it be Alexander Litvienko or Sergei Skripal. He will not allow traitors to survive. Um, so it is not a big surprise for many of us that we have seen such a blatant and obvious shooting down of the jet, um, because that sends a very strong message to anyone who would dare to threaten Putin that action will be taken against them. Uh, and how concern, uh, concerned has, uh, or how closely has, have the Foreign Affairs Select Committee uh, and, and yourself been monitoring what uh, President Putin and Yevgeny um, Prigozhin have been doing in the last few months since that attempted coup? So we released a report, I think about three weeks after the attempted coup, about the Wagner network, because I'm really concerned about how extensive their networks are. They've been operating in Africa now since 2014, and the model is essentially guns for gold. They are Putin's war dogs. They go into a country, they provide the military prowess that failing regimes want to maintain their survival, and in return they get access to critical minerals or gold and other items such as that. The reality is that the Wagner network is too uh, important for Putin allow, to allow it to fail. And it's quite interesting, at the recent Russia-Africa summit, uh, he was introducing a new figure to many African countries who I suspect will now step forward and run those operations across Africa. Uh, and, of course, uh, reports now that uh, if indeed Yevgeny Prigozhin is on that plane, uh, mm -hmm. whether he was behind it or is behind it or not, President Putin will seemingly be uh, considered that he, he was behind it and, and be, come out of this potentially stronger. How much of a concern is that vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the war in Ukraine and, and President Putin's um, support around the world? Look, there is a very specific reason for this shooting down, and that is to send a message to make sure that no one else feels that they should take the risk of going up against Putin. But also there is a high chance that Putin will be given a high degree of deniability on this. And it is also possible that, of course, senior security figures could have commissioned the shooting down of the jet rather than Putin himself. We just uh, don't uh, Alicia know. Kearns, bear, bear with me. Um, Joe Biden is uh, on holiday in Lake Tahoe, but we have now heard from him about this crash. Let's listen in. 
I don't know for a fact what happened, but I am not surprised. Do you believe Putin is behind this, sir? There's not much that happens in Russia not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. I've been working out for the last hour. Will you watch the debates later? I'm going to try to see if get as much as I can. What's your expectation for the GOP debate tonight? I have not. <laughs> Thank you all. Do you believe, do you believe you, Trump should debate? President Biden there speaking to media shortly after news uh, of this plane crash that you're seeing pictures on your screen now of uh, uh, that we broke here on Sky News earlier this evening. There is not that much that happens in Russia that Putin is not behind, he said. Uh, Alicia Kearns MP, uh, that's uh, pretty much what you were saying too, that uh, you, you have no doubts that President uh, Putin had a hand in this. Look, it's highly likely that Putin did, and that is why he's been setting up someone else to replace uh, Rogozhin a lot. He can't allow this sort of disloyalty to stand. But it is possible, and we have seen this in Russia before, that senior parts of the security apparatus themselves decided to take out uh, Prigozhin. We know that Shoigu has a long-running uh, animosity with him going back to Syria in 2015. Gerasimov, again, not a big fan of his. Um, so it is possible that someone else within the regime ordered it. But let's be very clear, their goal is also to give Putin deniability in every way that they can. But of course, this benefits Putin in every single way. And of course, as, as we see this unfold, uh, I was speaking earlier to uh, a Ukrainian MP who said there, were, there wasn't space in Russia for two uh, ruthless personalities, two seeming would be, uh, well, one emperor and one wannabe emperor like Prigozhin and Putin. Uh, but if uh, Prigozhin has gone uh, and there are these vacuums created and you've spoken about animosities and uh, enmities, how concerned should we be about a destabilised Russia? Uh, we, we might be watching this thinking, oh, this is, you know, R Russia doing what Russia does and President Putin's playbook sitting back and looking at this here from uh, uh, the West. However, sh there might also be concerns of, of what might unfold in the Kremlin now. So, yes, this is two warlords battling it out. Um, but ultimately, a destabilised Russia is in no one's interest. The impact that would have would be significant. But I do not think that the killing of Prigozhin is going to make a big difference on the front lines in Ukraine. It may cause some units who will be gravely aggrieved by Prigozhin's death to take action, but it is unlikely to be significant. This is Putin clearing up business. He is clearing up the mafia boss that he empowered, that he encouraged, who he gave explicit support to. The Wagner network was Putin's tool. It will continue to be his key foreign policy tool. He flies out troops in Russian Air Force jets. He provides their uh, machine guns. He provides their tents, their uniforms, you name it. They are his war dogs. But he has now found a new ruler to master over those war dogs. And how closely um, should we be watching President Putin and who, what he does next? As you said, he, he already seemingly has someone lined up to replace Prigozhin. Earlier, I was speaking to retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, who was talking about um, uh, how Prigozhin's assets were being distributed already. Uh, tonight, President Putin uh, looking like business is, as usual at a concert, uh, marking the victory of Kursk. Uh, how closely will you be monitoring him now? So I think what will be really interesting is whether it is the head of the GRU's covert, uh, covert offensive operations team that does take over the Wagner network. Um, the reality is I don't think we're going to see much of a change on the ground in terms of Putin's efforts to destabilise uh, to Africa, uh, for him to maintain his grip on Russia and for him to continue but fail uh, in Ukraine. Ultimately, this is all about domestic politics. This is about Putin maintaining control within Russia. And that is what his primary goal is. OK, Alicia Kearns, uh, MP, uh, Chair of the For Foreign Affairs Select Committee, thanks very much indeed for speaking to us here on Sky News. You're watching Sky News tonight, breaking news this evening. Uh, there are reports that Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, leader of the Wagner Mercenary Group, was on board a plane that has crashed north of Moscow. These pictures on your screen right now believe to be 
of that plane crash. Now, the Russian Civil Aviation Authority says he was one of 10 people listed as on board the private jet. Uh, where uh, that is the private jet that we see pictures of crashing right now. Well, Prigozhin's private military group had staged an attempted mutiny against the Russian government in June, you may recall. Now, the Foreign Office have told us tonight that they're monitoring the situation closely. I was just speaking to the head of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, saying this is no surprise. These were two warlords, Putin and Prigozhin, battling it out. In the US, President Joe Biden has been briefed on the situation. A short while ago, we brought you a clip of him uh, speaking to the media while on holiday in Lake Tahoe, where he said, there is not that much that happens in Russia that Putin is not behind. Uh, before that, the spokesperson for the United States National Security Council, Adrienne Watson, had this to say, and I quote, uh, we have seen the reports, if confirmed, no one should be surprised. The disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow, and now it would seem to this. And that private army uh, she's referring to is, of course, the Wagner mercenary group. Um, and the head of that mercenary group was, of course, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the low-profile Russian businessman who went to jail and came out, went into catering and eventually became commander of that group. Well, as that news was breaking, this is what the Russian president was doing. Uh, let's bring you those pictures. Vladimir Putin was attending a concert in Kursk. These are the very latest from that event. It's the 80th anniversary of the victory of Soviet troops in the Battle of Kursk. And our Moscow correspondent earlier telling us of uh, Putin's um, uh, speech, speaking ferociously about beating adversaries and, uh, and victory for Russia. Well, earlier, for more reaction to the crash, I talked to Ukrainian MP Alexei Goncharenko. It's something predictable, I don't know, for the moment, is really Prigozhin dead. But if he is dead from the first moment of the mutiny, which was exactly two months ago, interesting coincidence, right? Just exactly two months ago, Prigozhin uh, made a mutiny and Putin was just on the edge and, and he was very scared. And in two months, Prigozhin is uh, probably dead. It looks like Putin killed him. From the first moment, it was clear that after mutiny, the planet is too small for both of them. So um, I was sure that Prigozhin's life is in danger. And uh, now we see the development of the situation. And it can be that Putin killed uh, his former uh, hand and his former mercenary leader, which he used, but uh, he lost control of him. Uh, are you... Are you, you clearly aren't surprised and you believe that President Putin very much has a hand in this? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. And uh, if Prigozhin is dead, so this is definitely is made by Vladimir Putin in his uh, KGB style to kill his uh, opponent just exactly in two months after mutiny to show that he is still Russian emperor. Because to be an emperor in Russia, you need to show your strength. And Putin showed his weakness two months ago. But I don't think it will help just, just watch it, this country, which pretends to call itself one of the like world superpowers. But what the mess is going on there, two months ago, mutiny and Prigozhin, I just want to remind you, uh, just destroyed several Russian helicopters and jets, uh, a like uh, down them, uh, military helicopters and jets. In two months, Prigozhin himself is killed in the jet. And, and that is the country which tries to show itself as civilized or something like this. This is a crazy country, absolutely. I am not uh, crying absolutely for Prigozhin. Today is Ukrainian National Flag Day. So it's a good present that Prigozhin, who is a killer and a criminal, who killed a lot of people in Ukraine, who killed a lot of people throughout the whole world. So he, if he is now dead, it's a good news. But who is Putin? Just imagine with whom we deal. The person who calls himself president of Russian Federation, but in reality is absolutely butcher and criminal and murderer. 
Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Goncharenko, uh, you mentioned there uh, that he is a killer. Uh, he was the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, which has uh, 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 has had a significant impact during the war on Ukraine. Yeah, that's that's true, and I think that Prigozhin deserved uh, the death, and maybe now finally he found it uh, for everything he did. It's interesting what will be after, because there are also news that not only Prigozhin, but his deputy, his right hand, Mr. Utkin, who was former Russian Secret Service officer and who was a real military leader of Wagner Group, because Prigozhin uh, was never a military person, and that was Utkin who was a military leader, so maybe he's also dead. It means that Wagner Group is completely decapitated, if it's true. And uh, definitely it's also the question what will now happen with these uh, five, 6,000 people who are now mostly uh, encamped in Belarus, which is in reality occupied by Russia. Some of them maybe now in, in, in Africa, the last video that you show, the screenshot on your screen, this is the video from Africa, from we don't know, maybe it was in Libya, uh, where Prigozhin was saying that we are working here in Africa in order to, to promote Russian interests there. So that's the question, what will be now with this gang of mercenaries? Yeah, and, and what is your your concern about what happens next, uh, uh, given uh, President Putin's now seemingly dealt with uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin? For, now, for us, nothing new. Putin is a criminal, Putin is a murderer. Russia is more and more in mess. I think that soon we will have some more breaking news from Russia. I don't know what will happen. But uh, if Putin is on the track to his own kind of uh, sudden death or something like this, this is how uh, Russian emperors like him uh, usually finish uh, their life. So we don't know, but uh, Russia is in very big turbulence. How it will happen next, what will happen next, I just can't answer to you. For me, the most important is that Ukraine should liberate its territories and have a fence, huge fence on the border with this crazy country. Well, that was uh, Ukrainian MP Alexei uh, Goncharev. Now, earlier I got the thoughts of former Russian diplomat Boris Bondarev, a critic of President Putin's war against Ukraine. I believe uh, such a response has been anticipated by many experts, uh, considering that uh, Prigozhin and his mutiny attempt uh, made Putin look weak in the eyes of his elite, people, military, and all. And Putin has uh, to respond aggressively to that in order to uh, maintain his uh, um, grip on power. And uh, he, he, he behaved, I mean, President Putin behaved during this mutiny and after behaved as a weak leader, weaker than he should have. And so I think if Prigozhin is dead by now, it will benefit President Putin and will help him to show that he's still strong, he still commands the, his uh, high authority, and any attempts against him will be punished one way or another. So it doesn't matter whether President Putin is directly behind this uh, air crash or it's just a coincidence, but he will interpret it uh, this way, of course. But right, because I the think perspective the main thing will be that it, President Putin yes. has dealt swiftly with this, whether he was involved yeah. Yeah. or, or yeah. not. And, and there yes. has been a, an interesting period between that coup attempt and this crash, where Yevgeny Prigozhin was, of course, sent to uh, Belarus, uh, and we wondered whether that was going to be um, an attempt by Wagner to invade Ukraine from Belarus. And then, of course, we most recently saw him in Africa declaring that that, uh, the Wagner Group was going to protect Africa? Um, as, as we have all, all, all seen, Mr. Prigozhin has been full of surprises and he's a very unpredictable kind of person. So we cannot be 100% sure that he is a victim of this uh, air crash. And the problem is that we, we um, will very unlikely have any reliable data from Russia about this. 
all information is controlled by the government, so they will issue only the information they they look uh, they see fit. So if they if they think that Prigozhin is dead and that benefits them, they will show us his uh, I don't know uh, remains or something. But uh, they may say say that his um, the body cannot be identified, and so we will have some room for speculation. So I, I believe that uh, we will never, we will not have any reliable information anytime soon. Right, that's interesting. And what, what more can you tell us about Yevgeny Prigozhin? Of course, we know he was a, a relatively low-profile pro Russian businessman at one point. He, he then went to jail, came out, opened a, a hot dog stand, became a caterer and became known as Putin's chef. Well, uh, frankly, I am not a very big expert on Evgeny Prigozhin, and I just I know <laughs> what what you just listed about him. But yes, he is a very interesting uh, person in Russian elite, someone who is in, in in Putin's elite, but outside the elite. He's not in Putin's team, so to speak. He's not from uh, former KGB staff, so he is kind of a self-made man and uh, rabbit uh, dog of Putin. Who, who was used for some Putin's undercover operations in Africa, in other countries, and now in Ukraine. But, uh, well, it's 90 percent, uh, I'm 90 percent sure that his mutiny was not considered by Putin as something that can be really forgiven. And, and where do you think President Putin goes from here then? Would he continue using a mercenary group like the Wagner Group? Um, or do, do you think he'd take a, a different tack? Um, well, it's, it's good to speculate that uh, perhaps they will try to avoid any repetition of such experience with Wagner Group. So any other mercenary groups, any other mercenary units will be directly and strictly subordinated to Ministry of Defense. And it's been already done. So, but anyway, there is a new legislation in Russia that a lot of uh, regional governors can now make their own uh, private uh, mercenary ar armies. So uh, I, I don't see that this story, particular story, will have a significant impact on how Russia wages its war in Ukraine, really. And, of course, President Putin ha has precedence of being linked to assassinations and attempted assassinations. Um, uh, of course, uh, Mr Litvinenko and others uh, here in Salisbury, too. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and, we know, and this uh, air crash is, is different because all previous assassinations were made through poisoning or something or something more subtle ways, so to speak. This is very brutal, but maybe that's the response that Putin wanted to show that the brutal mutiny against his power will be brutally punished. So I wouldn't be very surprised about this. You're watching Sky News and uh, breaking news in the last few hours reports that uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Russian mercenary group Wagner, is on board a plane that's crashed north of Moscow. These pictures uh, that we have here at Sky News of that crash site. We also have pictures of that plane coming down north of Moscow. Um, let's bring in our defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Um, uh, good evening to you, Professor Clark. And of course, we don't know whether he was indeed on that plane. The Russian Civil Aviation Authority says he was listed as boarding that plane. Um, Eight bodies recovered so far, but significantly all eyes on Yevgeny Prigozhin, of course, because of the significant figure he became during the war in Ukraine, but also because of the man, him being the man that challenged President Putin uh, and marched on to Moscow. Yeah, and um, we don't know yet, there's no positive identification of these eight bodies. And looking at the, at the crash site, these bodies would be quite hard to identify because they'll all be uh, mangled up and, and burned. 
the Wagner channels have been saying in the last hour, this is the, their own t telegram channels, have been saying that they are confirming that Prigozhin is dead, along with Dmitry Utkin, who was the deputy or was the co-founder of, of uh, Wagner in uh, 2014. Now, that's what Wagner, some Wagner people are saying, but it's plausible, um, but it won't be confirmed for quite some time. But this is undoubtedly big news because it, it, whatever it does to the war in Ukraine, and in a way the, the effect on the war will probably be marginal, but it reinforces the fact that the Russia is a, is a gangster state. It's run in a gangster way from the top right to, through to the very bottom with corruption down at the lowest possible level. And, of course, most people are saying in the West, well, if Prigozhin is dead, this has only been a matter of time. He's been a dead man walking since the 24th of June when this, uh, this attempted coup seems to have been tried, the, the march of Rostov on, on Moscow. Um, and it, it makes President Putin look very weak, the fact that Prigozhin not only was uh, got away with it, but was then transiting between Belarus and Moscow, and he was going back to Moscow. He had a meeting with, uh, with uh, Putin on the 29th of June, along with 35 of the Wagner rebels, and Putin didn't even get what he wanted at that meeting. So Putin has looked very, very weak. It also, I mean, you know, one learns in these sorts of news times, these, these uh, uh, immediate events, to be a little bit careful because m many more things come out in the next 24 hours afterwards. Uh, you know, lots of complications, lots of other angles se seem to crop up. Um, so we do have to be a little bit careful. But it's not, it's not obvious that he's dead at the moment. He probably is, but it's, there's still some plausible idea that this might have been some sort of setup. It's certainly not obvious that Mr Putin may have had to be behind it. There's any number of people in Moscow among the elite who wanted him dead. There's been rumours for a long time that uh, Timchenko, for instance, uh, Gennady Timchenko, has had a contract out on him for well over a year. That may or may not be true, but these rumours swirl around. Um, he only has, I mean, Prigozhin only had one friend, really, among the elite, uh, and that was uh, Udoi, uh, a man who was the uh, governor of Tula, of Tula uh, who seemed to get on with him, as well as Shogu, the defence minister. But, I mean, you know, everybody else in Moscow, all of the elite, all of the people close to Putin, detested Prigozhin and thought he was very dangerous. So, in that respect, this is not surprising, but lots of detail, I'm sure, other detail, confusing detail, will emerge in the next 24, 48 hours. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, as you say, the devil is in the detail. Uh, uh, and for viewers joining us now, we are reporting that there has been a plane crash north of Moscow. Uh, these pictures coming in to us here at Sky News of that plane tumbling down through the skies uh, uh, over, over Moscow. Uh, and we also brought you the pictures of that crash site. Interestingly, uh, Moscow correspondent Michael, say, Diana Magne, saying that there was also reports of a second plane right behind that one yeah. zigzagging its way through the skies behind it. So uh, there is a lot of intrigue tonight around the plane crash, the nature of this plane crash, uh, whether or not indeed the Evgeny Prigozhin was on board and of course President Putin tonight at that concert marking the victory in Kursk seemingly going about his business as though nothing has really happened. Yes, um, I mean, he's in Kursk to, to mark the uh, great Second World War tank battle of Kursk, the victory at Kursk, which is part of the Russian national uh, picture, as it were, of the, of the great patriotic war. And the aircraft uh, footage is quite interesting. Yeah, reports of the two aircraft are in the air. Early reports, they were both Prigozhin's aircraft, and the second one turned back to Moscow after the incident. Um, that may or may not turn out to be true. Uh, lots of speculation that one aircraft may have shot down another aircraft. There's a little bit of supporting evidence for that. When we see that the piece of film that we're running now of the aircraft falling out of the sky, I mean, when an aircraft blows up in midair, it doesn't fall out of the sky in a coherent way. It just, it just breaks up and the bits fall out of the sky. In this case, when you see the aircraft coming down, it's sort of, it, it's um, sort of leafing down, it's like sycamore leafing down, as if it's been hit or some sort of catastrophic failure has taken place in its uh, command system, in its flying controls. So it doesn't, to me, look like an aircraft that had a bomb on board, but it does look like an aircraft that has been hit by something outside which does enough damage to wreck the control surfaces, and so the aircraft goes into a, a death dive that the pilots can't do anything about. When you see the way the aircraft comes down, it has that look about it, but, you know, I'm only guessing from what we see on the clips that we've been running. 
Yeah, and the truth is, Michael, that we may or may ne not ever get an investigation because all of this will be in Russia's hands on what information is released. But this certainly reminiscent... Uh, I was speaking earlier to Michael Bosicu, who was the OSC mm. spokesperson uh, and uh, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, who gained access to the crash site of MH17. Yeah. Uh, and we know uh, about uh, Russia's hand behind that too. Uh, let's talk a little, Michael, about President Putin's um, uh, uh, playbook, so to speak. We know that uh, how he deals with adversaries, uh, he deals with them swiftly and ruthlessly, no matter where they are. Uh, of course, we know about the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, Sergei Skripal, uh, and uh, Boris Bondarev saying to me that this is a, a far more brutal way of dealing um, with somebody, if indeed President Putin is behind this. Um, but but we have seen MH17 crash too. Yes, I mean, the MH17 crash was uh, was created by a Buck missile, a Buck anti-aircraft missile, that was under the control of um, uh, Gherkin, uh, the man with Strelkov, his real name is, but he called himself Alexander Gherkin, who's now been arrested, incidentally. Uh, not Nothing to do with this. He's just been arrested for being anti-Kremlin because he's such a Russian uh, nationalist. But, but that, the MH17 aircraft, was brought down by a missile fired by the separatists uh, in the Donetsk region uh, in 19, uh, 2014, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, and then the, the other uh, poisonings, Litvinenko and Skripal, and a number of other poisonings around the world and people falling out of windows, is generally attributed to the GRU, which is the military intelligence arm. And the GRU have been, as we're going through their own assassination list for a number of years, and, we, and our own intelligence people have said that they, they know that Putin has, as it were, approved this list. He may, not, he may not have given orders for any particular assassination, but he certainly approved the fact that the GRU going, go around the world doing all of this. Professor Michael Clark, thank you very much indeed for your analysis. You are watching Sky News and we have reports that uh, the Grey Zone Telegram channel linked to the Wagner Group is saying that Yevgeny Prigozhin is dead, that he was on board this plane that crashed north of Moscow and was uh, uh, has been killed in that plane crash. Well, to discuss the wider implications of today's crash, I've been talking to Michael Bossiak, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. It's definitely straight out of a Putin playbook to get rid of opponents. Um, I'm in Johannesburg right now for the BRICS summit. And of course, there's going to be a lot of interest in uh, finding out whether in fact this was the case that Prigozhin was killed. As you know, he has, the Wagner group has deep, deep interests here not only uh, extraction of blood diamonds and gold, but also um, uh, uh, an arm of the Russian uh, state security service in terms of providing security to a lot of uh, belligerents here. Um, normally, one would expect uh, Mr. Putin and his uh, cronies to get rid of an opponent through traditional means, poisoning, poison umbrella tip or cocktail. But this, if, if proven true, is very, very brazen and... Uh, and probably in their minds, so what if there are any people not related to Prigozhin on board? And, of course, we, we don't know if he was indeed on board, um, Michael. Uh, uh, speaking earlier to Boris Bondarev, he said he's full of surprises. Um, so we are erring on, on the side of caution tonight right. on, on Sky News. But uh, a significant figure nonetheless. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, when uh, the so-called coup was staged and then there was a disappearance for a while of Prigozhin, um, I said at the time uh, that I don't believe we would see him disappearing into Belarus and, uh, you know, driving a tractor digging potato fields, nor would he disappear here. Um, he's been very active, uh, quite the jet setter. Uh, in fact, he was filmed uh, north of here in the Sahel just recently uh, saying that the Wagner group is basically alive and well. So maybe it all became too much for Mr. Putin. Uh, two egos don't survive well in the same uh, uh, bubble. And um, my question here, and, and you're right, we have to be very careful what we say at the moment, but if uh, Prigozhin and Wagner is now out of the equation, who is going to take over that very, very lucrative business here in Africa 
to fund the Putin uh, war machine. I don't think uh, the Russian state security services or security services such as Gazprom, uh, a few others have the ability to do that just yet. Uh, and also an extraordinary um, pla plane crash to witness, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, at the same time, President Putin on stage at a concert uh, marking the Kursk victory, um, speaking quite uh, fiercely about uh, uh, victors and uh, adversaries. It would be uh, straight out of the Putin playbook uh, to uh, appear as if he's going about business as usual and doing other things and has nothing uh, to do with this. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, this is something in terms of what we're seeing on the screen right now, it is out of their playbook. I mean, you you know what probably came to mind when I saw this down aircraft. It was MH17. We well know the Russians have the capability of striking an aircraft at very, very high altitude as well. So uh, that would be also uh, straight uh, straight out of their playbook too. We have to be careful again. Uh, we also have to um, remember that this also could have been promotion staging a disappearance uh, in some twisted way. So um, I, it, it remains to be seen what exactly happened here. And, and Michael, in terms of the significance of, uh, of Prigozhin vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Wagner Group and leading the Wagner Group, um, if indeed he was on this plane and if indeed he has been killed, uh, what, we are looking a little bit ahead here, but what, what do you think the impact will be on the Wagner Group and what happens on the ground in Ukraine? Yeah, well, first of all, um, what happens in Russia, if I may, I don't. I, I think actually the Wagner Group um, misread Russian public opinion that they had more support than they thought when they staged the coup. Uh, I don't think the remnants of the group would be able to cause much trouble. And in terms of the war in Ukraine, I think they were mostly already subtracted from that theater of, the, of war, basically handing it over uh, to the uh, Russian Ministry of Defense. But um, I was watching the uh, Ukrainian telegram channels, as you might imagine, lots of joy and celebration of these reports. Uh, but uh, we all know how poorly the, uh, the Russian military has performed on the Ukrainian uh, battlefront. Um, so it, it's, it's not going to help them in that regard. But what we are seeing, broadening out the picture a little bit, is uh, Russia is increasingly turning more to those uh, long-range missiles, those drones, to execute their aggression in Ukraine. And this is very scary stuff. I'm temporarily based in Odessa. We see it close up. Um, they're doing more and more of this. So now you basically have two uh, battlefronts, the, the physical one in eastern Ukraine, as well as the long-range one. Uh, and um, that's a very, very difficult position for Ukraine to be in at the moment, and especially especially because of the slowness um, that the counteroffensive is happening. Uh, and, um, Michael, of course, uh, we've talked about being straight out of Putin's playbook in terms of how he deals with adversaries. He, there is also, of course, an ICC arrest warrant out for him. You mentioned that you're there in South Africa for the BRICS summit. He didn't attend uh, because uh, he, he couldn't because of the potential of, of an arrest. President Putin... Uh, whether he is behind this or not, will certainly uh, allow people to think he is because he wants his adversaries to think he is. Yeah, you know, we were watching him very closely this morning. Uh, he was on live video as opposed to recorded video yesterday. He looked, um, I have to say, very tired, uh, almost anxious or nervous. Um, his absence from here when you have his big, these big players like Xi Jinping of China Mr. Modi of India here um, shows uh, his increasingly limited horizons as well as his increasing uh, uh, isolation. Uh, it's not the same as uh, being here in person. There's a lot of bilaterals going on. And um, I have to say the other thing I noticed today, Saima, is that uh, uh, the foreign minister uh, of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, 
basically looked like a, a, a puppet uh, sitting there not doing much. But it was very noticeable. The other thing I can tell you from being here for a few days now is um, there is almost um, an affection for Russia here on the ground in South Africa because of the historical ties, especially with the ANC. And if you listen to South African media, some of it, um, they word for word report what Mr. Uh, Putin says. So that was a bit of a surprise for me. And uh, one more thing, if I can, a uh, huge amount of um, Russian media here. I was sitting right next to them, and they're basically parroting everything that Mr. Putin says. But I think um, among the African leaders, uh, especially those more to the north, uh, who have gotten used to Wagner on the ground there, this is going to be a big shock to them to, to have this out of the to have him out of the equation. You're watching Sky News. Breaking news tonight. A plane has crashed north of Moscow. Ten people on board, one of them uh, apparently the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin. The Grey Zone Telegram channel says he is dead. Stay tuned to Sky News. Good evening. Breaking news. Uh, there are reports that Yevgeny Prigozhin, leader of the Wagner mercenary group, was on board a private jet that crashed just north of Moscow. Russia's Civil Aviation Authority says that Prigozhin was one of ten on the passenger list. Prigozhin's private army had staged a failed mutiny two months ago in June. Here in the UK, the Foreign Office say they are monitoring the situation in Russia closely. Now, in the US, President Biden gave his reaction to the crash during his holiday to Lake Tahoe. I don't know for a fact what happened, but I'm not surprised. Do you think, do you, do you believe? I mean, not much that happens when the Russian is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. I've been working out for the last hour and a half. 
Now, as the news was breaking of that reported plane crash, President Putin was doing this. He was attending a concert in Kursk to mark the 80th anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany at the Battle of Kursk. Our Moscow correspondent Diana Magne has been following the story for us all evening and has this update. According to the Russian Emergencies Ministry, um, he was on board. We understand that eight bodies have been found at the crash site, um, but we were told that ten passengers or three pilots and uh, seven passengers were on the list of those on board. We also understand from telegram channels that Dmitry Utkin, who was essentially uh, Prigozhin's number two at Wagner, was on board. But all of this uh, does need further confirmation. It would be extremely convenient for uh, 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 the Kremlin, for Yevgeny Prigozhin now to be no more. Uh, I think he has been a massive problem for Vladimir Putin um, uh, ever since, certainly, the very short-lived mutiny that he launched on Moscow on June the 23rd and 24th, but also in the weeks and months before, when he very loudly and publicly across uh, social media railed against uh, the way Russia's uh, operation in Ukraine was being conducted and against the Russian army leadership. Um, and... All right, just to uh, interrupt Diana there for a second, just to bring you the very latest that's coming in from the Russian Civil Aviation Authority. They are the ones that first broke this news of this uh, business jet crashing just north of Moscow. And they have said in the last couple of minutes that uh, Evgeny Prigozhin and his second-in-command, Dmitry Utkin, were on board that plane that crashed in the Tver region just north of Moscow. The jets uh, carrying the two men, according to the Russian uh, Civil Aviation Agency, was on its way from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Uh, as we've been reporting, it crashed just north of Moscow, and now the Russian Civil Aviation Authority are confirming and of course, they did confirm this before, and this is coming through other news agencies as well, that Yevgeny Prigozhin and uh, Dmitry Utkin, the uh, chief and second-in-command of the Wagner mercenary group, were on board that jet. Now, earlier, my colleague Simon Mosin was speaking to the chair of the uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs, Alicia Kearns. Uh, she had this to say. It's highly likely that Putin did, and that is why he's been setting up someone else to replace uh, Rogozhin a lot. He can't allow this sort of disloyalty to stand. But it is possible, and we have seen this in Russia before, that senior parts of the security apparatus themselves decided to take out uh, Prigozhin. We know that Shoigu has a long-running uh, animosity with him going back to Syria in 2015. Gerasimov, again, not a big fan of his. Um, so it is possible that someone else within the regime ordered it. But let's be very clear, their goal is also to give Putin deniability in every way that they can. But of course, this benefits Putin in every single way. And of course, as, as we see this unfold, uh, I was speaking earlier to uh, a Ukrainian MP who said there, were, there wasn't space in Russia for two uh, ruthless personalities, two seeming would be, uh, well, one emperor and one wannabe emperor like Prigozhin and Putin. Uh, but if uh, Prigozhin has gone uh, and there are these vacuums created and you've spoken about animosities and uh, enmities, how concerned should we be about a destabilised Russia? Uh, where we might be watching this thinking, oh, this is, you know, R Russia doing what Russia does and President Putin's playbook, sitting back and looking at this here from uh, uh, the West. However, sh there might also be concerns of, of what might unfold in the Kremlin now. So, yes, this is two warlords battling it out. Um, but ultimately, a destabilised Russia is in no one's interest. The impact that would have would be significant. But I do not think that the killing of Prigozhin is going to make a big difference on the front lines in Ukraine. It may cause some units who will be gravely aggrieved by Prigozhin's death to take action. 
but it is unlikely to be significant. This is Putin clearing up business. He is clearing up the mafia boss that he empowered, that he encouraged, who he gave explicit support to. The Wagner network was Putin's tool. It will continue to be his key foreign policy tool. He flies out troops in Russian Air Force jets. He provides their uh, machine guns. He provides their tents, their uniforms, you name it. They are his war dogs. But he has now found a new ruler to master over those war dogs. And how closely um, should we be watching President Putin and who, what he does next? As you said, he, he already seemingly has someone lined up to replace Prigozhin. Earlier, I was speaking to retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, who was talking about um, uh, how Prigozhin's assets were being distributed already. Uh, tonight, President Putin uh, looking like business as, as usual at a concert, uh, marking the victory of Kursk. Uh, how closely will you be monitoring him now? So I think what will be really interesting is whether it is the head of the GRU's covert, uh, covert offensive operations team that does take over the Wagner network. Um, the reality is I don't think we're going to see much of a change on the ground in terms of Putin's efforts to destabilise uh, to Africa, uh, for him to maintain his grip on Russia and for him to continue but fail uh, in Ukraine. Ultimately, this is all about domestic politics. This is about Putin maintaining control within Russia and that is what his primary goal is. Lisa Cairns there speaking uh, to Sky News earlier. Now, I'm joined by our uh, defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark, for his thoughts on what we're seeing coming out of Russia. And, and Michael, let's just re remind our viewers that news that's come out in the last few minutes that Russia's Civil Aviation Authority are reporting that both Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of mm -hmm. Wagner, and his second in command, Dmitry Utkin, were on board that jet. Mm. Interesting. I mean, Utkin is the uh, co-founder of, uh, of Wagner. In a way, he, he started it, in a sense, before Prigozhin. And reputedly, Utkin was the man who gave it the name of Wagner, who named it after the composer Wagner, because he liked these grand operas, and you know, they've gone to their own Gotterdammerung now, I suppose. Um, and the Wagner channels, the Grey Zone channel, has said, yeah, it's Prigozhin, it's Utkin. Mm -hmm. Utkin was the man who was involved in Wagner in Africa. Yeah. And so while Prigozhin was taking care of Wagner in in, uh, Syria and Ukraine, uh, Utkin was the Africa man. And since the coup, Utkin seemed to come together. There was uh, evidence that Utkin was in uh, Azerbaijan in Belarus when they transferred to Belarus, that he was there. People wondered what his role would be. So they're both gone now, mm. and that seems to be confirmed. So the question is, who, who does that leave? Um, one would be Alexander Kuznetsov is a possibility. And the other one is Andrei Troshev, mm. who's the chief of staff, um, effectively the, the, the fixer, in the Wagner operations in Ukraine. So Trashev and uh, Kuznetsov are the, are the next two that you would look to to say, what are these guys doing? And were they, were, was one of them on the plane? Yeah. If not, where are they? Um, Trashev is the person that, if Putin had to live with anybody in Wagner, he would live with Trashev right. as the leader, because he suggested it in this crazy meeting he had on the 29th of June, when he had 35 Wagner operatives and Prigozhin in front of him in the Kremlin, and he said, well, why don't you work under Trashev? And apparently some of them nodded, and Prigozhin said, no, 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 they won't work under Trashev. Right. So, anyway... So he has, we'll, a, he has a preferred person who would... So it seems. ...who we're not sure if that, that person is on the jet, but no if they idea. survive, they may well no. rise to the top of this organisation. And we'll, we'll come on to what may well come of Wagner afterwards, because, as I understand it, um, many of their troops are in Belarus yep. at the moment as well. Um, now, this, is, of course, has come from the Russian news agency, TASS, and they were the ones who broke this story, first of all. And it is worth saying, of course, this is all unconfirmed, basically because it's come from the Russian news agencies. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, one thing you learn in these cases is when this dr dramatic news happens like this, in the next 24 hours, other details will come out mm. which seem to be at variance with it, will be very confusing, and it takes time for a story to settle down. And exactly as you say, Kamali, I mean, anything coming out of the Russian news agencies is going to be manipulated or it's going to be um, uh, sort of washed before it comes out. And nobody will ever get to the bottom of, of huh. what the identification of these eight bodies really is. They might choose to tell the truth, but we won't know if they're telling the truth or not. And there certainly won't be any sort of international uh, op Is there a way that Western agencies can try and seek verification 
Oh, they can try and cross-reference it, uh, and they will. They'll try and cross-reference it from other mm. things they know. And I mean, I think Western agencies will, will end up saying, we are 80% we are convinced that this is the case or that is the case. But they'll never be as certain as they could be, mm. say, with the MH17 crash, which came down... About, by the time they got to the crash site, they knew that the Russians had, had removed a lot of stuff, but they were able to put together so much forensic material that the Dutch, for instance, knew what had happened to their people who were on MH17 that was brought down by uh, um, uh, Gherkin, uh, Alexander Gherkin, Strelkov, his real name was, who was a, one of the separatists in the Donbass. And now, he brought it down with the Russian anti-aircraft missile. We know that for certain now. Uh, uh, well, the question then will be, uh, on this particular jet, this Embraer, which I understand is one of the safest jets out there, what actually, as we're looking at these pictures now, Michael, what actually did... Uh, bring this craft down. I mean, what can we draw from uh, yeah. the images that we've seen, obviously shot by someone nearby on a mobile phone? Yeah, I mean, well, it's pure speculation, obviously. We're, I mean, we only know what we see up there. When aircraft uh, are blown up in the air with a bomb, they normally disintegrate in a more catastrophic way. This aircraft looks as like if it's coming down in the sort of sycamore leaf. It's, it's, it's out of control, it's in a death dive, but it's still in one piece, more or less, um, and it's turning... And, and, and clearly the pilots, if they're alive at this point, have got no control over the aircraft. That's usually what happens when an aircraft is hit, say, by a missile or something like that, that, mm. that the missile does catastrophic damage to the controls of the aircraft, makes it unflyable, and, I mean, jet aircraft don't glide very well. So, you know, once they're hit, they, they come, like, come down like bricks. Um, that's what it looks like. So if I had to guess, if somebody just showed me that and said, did that blow up or was it hit by something, I'd say it was hit by something. Yeah, uh, and hit by something, hit by some surface-to-air missile, surface to a missile or air-to-air air -to -air missile, missile, something like that. Um, and, of course, there's all these stories. There's, there was another aircraft in the air, which, which initially was said also to be a Prigozhin aircraft, mm. and that that aircraft moved around a little bit and then turned back to Moscow. Now, that's not inconsistent with a hit from a missile on the ground or an, another fighter aircraft above it, who knows? Mm. And, and, of course, it is worth reporting as well that despite that coming in from the Russian Civil Aviation Authority in the past few minutes, in the minutes after the reports came of the plane coming down and there were 10 people on board, it was reported that eight bodies had been recovered, mm. two bodies obviously missing in the uh, manifest of the 10 that were on board. Yes. Um, can we... Can we... We can't yet, I guess, at this stage, be certain that this will have been ordered by Vladimir Putin himself. No, uh, there are lots of candidates for this. I mean, maybe Putin ordered it. Everyone assumed that uh, Prigozhin was a dead man walking after the 24th of June, which was his attempted coup, uh, such as it was. Um, but uh, lots of people wanted Prigozhin out of the way. I mean, he was hated by all of the oligarchs. The only person who had any time for him was Michael Duermin, who is the, is the uh, governor of Tula, mm -hmm. who had been one of uh, Putin's bodyguards. He'd been in the defence ministry. Very able man, uh, Duermin. You know, keep your eye on him in terms of what's going to happen in Russia in the next couple of years. And he gets on with people, and he, he seemed to be able to get on with Prigozhin. And he was also close to Shogu, the defence minister, who absolutely hated Prigozhin. Prigozhin and Shogu, you know, couldn't even be in the same, mm. in the same city together, let alone the same room. Um, and Duermin was one of the few people who could get on with him. But other people, I mean, Timchenko, Gennady Timchenko, one of the oligarchs, very rich oligarch, was said, rumoured to have had a contract out on him for a long time. Mm. And a lot of oligarchs are rumoured to have had contracts out on this man. Prior to the coup? Yes, yes. Right. I, mean, for, I mean, they, they, you, they saw him as dangerous and uh, completely untrustworthy mm. in, in their terms, and somebody who, who had the, was developing the power with closeness to Putin to undermine the arrangements that they'd all made for their own empires and their own uh, wealth. And so, yes, he was widely hated. Mm. I mean, you've never accepted anyway. He's always an outsider mm -hmm. because, you know, he was a caterer. From, I mean, he was more than that. He was an entrepreneur. But, I mean, he got, the, he got, the, he got to know Putin and Putin gave him the contract for schools, yep. catering for, which was huge. And then he got the contract for the army, which was even bigger. And it was on that basis that he became a multi-billionaire. And then, of course, he started to invest in lots of other things around the world. And he was bankrolling Putin and Putin's family. And for all those reasons, all of the oligarchs around Putin hated him. Because yep. he was not Too one of close. them anyway. Yeah, and, and actually, if you remember, one of his complaints recently was about the food that his yes. men were getting, which was... <laughs> so we got the catering, you fixed it. Kind, kind of <laughs> ironic. All right, look, uh, this also has to be seen in the context of the war in Ukraine. Yeah. I mentioned that many of the Wagner troops seem to be in Belarus at the moment. What impact, if all of this is as it seems and these two men are dead, what impact will that have? Well, I mean, Wagner have withdrawn from Ukraine on their own admission. They said, we're not now in Ukraine. They're in Belarus, where they said that they are training the Belarusian army. I think that's... They may be doing a little bit of training, but that's not really why they're there. They, they clearly went to Belarus as part of the deal to create the hub for their global 
operations, so mainly in Africa. I mean, they've got, they've got big interest in Africa and they were really pushing those very, very hard. There's some evidence that they were playing games on the Polish border because one of the things that Putin would quite like to happen, we think, is for Wagner to be able to create some tension between Belarus and Poland because that all adds to his narrative that this is all a, a, a fix against, you know, his friend Lukashenko and him in Russia. Mm. And then a lot of Wagner people um, have gone home uh, and at home, there are, they are criminals. I mean, the, the first tranche of criminals who were recruited from the prisons, they survived the being on the front line. The first tranche when, were pardoned in January. Mm -hmm. Most of them went home and they've got involved in violent, nasty crime since and they're causing a real problem. So some of them are at home causing a problem, some of them are in Belarus causing a problem, and some of them have gone to Africa mm. causing bigger problems across the Sahel, which we've reported on over the last month. We certainly have right, Professor Clark, more from you throughout the evening, of course, and uh, we'll have more on the story, of course, throughout the evening and including after the break, where I'll be speaking to the former senior British military intelligence officer, Philip England. In Zaman Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. There are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was on the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch. When people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. I've always tried to put people at the heart of the story, like hearing from young women who've been spiked via injections. I just felt physically sick. That's really in my system. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do, just because you're homeless. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Welcome back. Let's get more now on uh, tonight's reported crash. We can speak to the former senior British military intelligence and security officer, Philip Ingram. Philip, a good to speak with you and good evening. Now, let's just remind uh, our viewers of the uh, details that come in from the Russian Civil Aviation Authority reporting that Yevgeny Prigozhin and Dmitry Utkin were, in fact, on board the plane, but there is something missing in that report, isn't there? 
saying that they were dead? Well, uh, they've, they've put a list of passengers that were on the plane um, and it hasn't said that those passengers have been confirmed dead. That That's the, clearly the manifest of individuals that were supposed to be on it or that the Russian authorities uh, had said they were on it in the first place. You know, as um, Professor Michael Clark said, you know, any of the Russian um, uh, government agencies are also big sources of disinformation. Um, and we will get lots of information, disinformation around this until um, we, we start to get more confirmed um, uh, evidence of uh, the bodies that are there, and that will be backed up by what's coming out of the intelligence agencies and governments um, in the West. Uh, so, Philip, talk to us about how uh, Western intelligence agencies will go about in the next uh, uh, hours and days and perhaps weeks ahead trying to verify exactly what has taken place here. Well, there, there's one thing that we know. Um, an aircraft has crashed and possibly been shot down in a, in a part of uh, Russia very near Moscow. Because uh, we've seen the pictures, the Russians have reported it, we can see the burning aircraft on the ground. So that gives a start point for the intelligence agencies to look at what was flying in the area at the time. And uh, Western intelligence has got a lot of um, uh, capabilities that are monitoring uh, the airspace over Russia almost continuously. Um, you can then dial back from that and start to look at where the flight started and where uh, the flight was supposed to be going to, um, who was on the manifest, and the Russian Aviation Authority have told us quite conveniently who was on the manifest, uh, and then to try and confirm uh, whether individuals um, that were on the manifest actually got onto the aircraft or not. Um, and there will be um, secret methods of, of uh, trying to confirm that um, and less secret methods of looking at what's in the press and looking at what's in social media uh, and everything else and bringing all of that together to try and build a coherent picture. So that'll be going on as we speak. Um, the, the reporting that we're seeing across the wider Telegram channels and uh, you know, I caveat Telegram here as one of the biggest sources of disinformation that we get around um, what's going on inside Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, but the volume of reporting and from a number of different channels and the comments that have been putting on, um, if I was to make a judgment call at the moment, I'd say it's probably slightly more likely than less likely that Prigozhin um, and Utkin, um, his sidekick, were on the aircraft. Yeah, and while we're talking, uh, Philip, we're looking at the footage of what seems to be a burning wreckage of that jet. I wonder, this is obviously um, user-generated content, it's shot on a mobile phone. How useful is that to the intelligence services to try and examine this sort of material? Extremely useful because you know, they, they'll be able to sit down and um, when, whenever the cameras pan back and look at it, there are some features that they'll then be able to geolocate. Uh, they'll be able to confirm um, all, of, all of that. You know, they will be able to analyse the detail of the picture. And we can see here the aircraft tumbling down to the ground. There were very early reports of two explosions uh, before the aircraft tumbled out of the air. Um, and then um, you know, that, that tar facility that's there um, behind the, the uh, slightly domed um, uh, uh, structure will be able to be geolocated fairly rapidly and fairly easily. So that all of that will add to uh, you've been able to build this wider picture. Um, and um, you know, if it has been proven that has been uh, uh, that Prigozhin has been shot down, you know, it's almost certain that this will have been sanctioned at the highest levels. Yeah, and Philip, on that then, and who may well have been behind this, what does this do to the uh, the effort, the war effort that's being conducted? Of by uh, the Russians, how much impact will this have? Uh, will it change in any way the way they prosecute this war? The, the, the tactical operations that are going on the, on the ground inside Ukraine, no, it'll have virtually no effect whatsoever on there. Um, it's the higher operational and strategic level uh, that's going on. You know, Prigozhin's uh, attempted coup, if it was an attempted coup, um, uh, embarrassed Putin. But actually, Prigozhin was overstepping his mark um, from a much earlier stage. He'd been openly critical of the Defence Minister Shoigu, the tactics that Shoigu and the overall commander into Ukraine, General Gerasimov, were showing, um, and the support that the Wagner troops were getting in their assaults into Bakhmut. Um, and whilst he was being openly critical of those in the Ministry of Defence and in the military, he was also um, getting statements out there that were suggesting that he had wider political ambitions, mm. potentially to take over from Vladimir Putin at some stage in the future. That is when Vladimir Putin will have started to go, Prigozhin's overstepped his mark, I made him, 
he should be um, supporting me an awful lot more than he's doing. He shouldn't be criticising my senior staff. Uh, and that's when Putin will have started to deal with a little bit of a plan to um, push Prigozhin out, but also to identify Prigozhin's supporters. Um, and one of the, his major supporters was General Armageddon, um, General uh, Surovikin, who used to command the Russian forces inside Ukraine, was then made a deputy commander to Gerasimov, and after the Prigozhin attempted coup, has disappeared completely and was allegedly sacked from being head of the Russian Air Force today. Yeah, it was just removed, and uh, Professor Clark tells me he may well be on holiday uh, at the moment. We're not entirely sure where Surovikin is, because you rightly mentioned he hasn't been seen since he gave what seems to be a sort of a hostage video asking um, uh, Prigozhin to turn his troops around on that day of the yeah. coup. And, and there's, a, there's a number of senior personnel that have disappeared. You've only seen Shoigu on a couple of occasions. We've only seen Gerasimov on one or two occasions. We haven't seen Patrushchev, who is the um, chairman of the Russian... Um, security Committee, National Security Committee. He's responsible for security um, inside Russia itself. He is effectively the, the, the person that's feeding Vladimir Putin all, all of the detail uh, and is what you would have been Putin's right-hand man, a natural successor, a former head of um, uh, Russian, Russian intelligence services, the, the FSB. Um, uh, and he's disappeared completely um, ever since that attempted coup. There's a lot going on in the background that we don't know about. And a lot of this isn't just within the political sphere underpinning all of it are the wider criminal networks that are exploiting the natural resources in Africa that are um, funding the oligarchs, funding Vladimir Putin. It's all built on this foundation of criminality um, that is underpinned by the, the state uh, that is Russia. Yeah, and oftentimes when we do see these people pop up in video, it's uh, impossible to know when that video was shot, yeah. which sort of adds to the misinformation and the sort of the opaque nature of what's actually going on behind the curtain there in Russia. Just talk to us a little bit, if you can, Philip, before we listen to uh, Christopher Steele um, telling us his thoughts about what may have happened. What may well happen now to the Wagner Group in its operations, as we were saying earlier, many of their troops are in Belarus, of course, we know that they're active in Africa. And the last time you saw Yevgeny Prigozhin, he purportedly was in Africa with his troops. Well, this, this is an interesting question. Um, Vladimir Putin, he probably didn't um, take action against Prigozhin so early on because of the influence that Prigozhin had, in particular, into Africa um, and getting the, the funding that's needed for, for the oligarchs to work. Um, Putin will have done as much as he can to try and set the conditions to take over Wagner operations in Africa and elsewhere. Um, or has got to the point where he feels there's nothing else he can do and needs to send a very clear message. And that's when he's ordered um, Prigozhin to be removed. Um, I understand reading again through a number of different channels that um, uh, the, the new command structure of the Wagner Group are um, going to make a statement fairly soon. It'll be interesting to see what they say. They will either have been subjugated and, and come under uh, a new command and control structure that Vladimir Putin has managed to get into place or they're going to be very anti it. And this is where there's some powerful people around with you know, Surovikin in particular and some of the, those that are associated with him uh, and you know, the, the, the influence that Wagner has in Africa and elsewhere. And that influence has got political influence back into Moscow again. So you know, this whole relationship with Wagner is going to be fascinating. We could see further destabilization in Russia. We could see even more destabilization across the areas that they're influencing in South Africa, which would cause the international community an even bigger headache. Absolutely right. Okay, uh, Philip Ingram, do appreciate that analysis and expertise. Thank you for now. Um, Professor Clark, you were listening into what mm -hmm. Philip was saying there and uh, sort of nodding along when he started talking about the destabilizing effects mm -hmm. that this may well have in uh, Africa, where Wagner have a sphere of influence. Yes, and I mean, as Philip was saying there, we, we're waiting to hear what the Wagner command structure, as it now is, wants to say. They will say something fairly soon. But, you know, the, 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 the idea that Putin is trying to get Wagner back into the regular army is not, I mean, he has talked in those sort of terms. Or or he's implied it, it's not very likely because these Wagner people don't want to join the regular army. I mean, mm. they, they, they will be victimised if they do. They'll be given all the worst jobs, all the most dangerous jobs, so they'll be eliminated in the fighting. They'll be put on the front line. They won't be earning the same amount of money. They'll do much better 
in the private military company sphere. There's about 25 private military companies running around in Ukraine on the Russian side. Mm -hmm. So Shogu, the defence minister, he has one himself called Patriot. And so he has his own private military company. The Gazprom, they have, I think it's called Torch, um, they have a private military company, which is their own security people, who they've sent to the war. So if you're a Wagner mercenary um, and you're thinking what to do next, there's any number of other private military groups you can go and join and still be in Ukraine or be sent to Africa, mm -hmm. whatever else. And earn the money rather than joining the regular army. And being exactly. I mean, the... Wagner, I'm, I'm sure, will not integrate into the regular army. They'll resist that. And, you know, the, the only bit of the regular army they're close to is the VDV, the Airborne, mm -hmm. because they train with them. Um, they, I mean, they, they share one of the bases with them. And that's why the VDV are under um, a, a cloud at the moment. Toplinsky, Mikhail Toplinsky, very well-respected officer who's head of the Airborne Forces, he's under a real shadow because it's believed that he was a bit close to Prigozhin, which I think indeed he was, and to Savinikin, uh, who Philip also mentioned. So you've got these, these, these groups, these factions within mm. the military, and Prigozhin is one part of a faction that was increasingly anti-Ministry of Defence, anti-Shogu, anti-Gerasimov. And we'll see more of that play out, I think, as a result of, of, of whatever happens next to the yeah. Wagner Group. And anti the way that they were prosecuting this war. Yeah. Um, Professor Clark, really appreciate your analysis, as always. Uh, so, just to remind you of that breaking news in the past uh, few minutes, that the Russian uh, Civil Aviation Authority say that uh, Evgeny Prigozhin and his second-in-command, Dmitry Utkin, were on board the plane that crashed just north of Moscow. Ten people were on board, eight bodies have been recovered. It's not clear whether or not yet Prigozhin and Utkin have lost their lives. We'll have more of this, of course, after the break, where I'll be speaking to the defence editor of The Economist, Shashank Joshi.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Hello and welcome back. We're continuing our breaking coverage of that plane crash just north of Moscow, the plane that was carrying the head of the Wagner Mercenary Group, Evgeny Prigozhin, and his second-in-command, Dmitry Utkin. Let's get the thoughts now of the defence editor of The Economist, Shashank Joshi. Shashank, it's really good to be able to speak with you uh, this evening. Uh, what do you make of the reporting, as we understand it so far, as I say, the Civil Aviation Authority in Russia saying that the plane carrying them has crashed? I think that um, it's uh, absolutely interesting to see the Wagner-linked Telegram channels. These are accounts on Russian social media affiliated to Mr. Prigozhin's Wagner group uh, are almost unanimously uh, acknowledging that he has died, so they're not um, clinging on to hope that he may have escaped on the second plane that was flying at the same time, or suggesting this is a, a, a conspiracy by the Russian state. And more importantly, they are squarely blaming the Russian government. They are calling the Russian government traitors. They are saying this will have catastrophic consequences. Um, and I think that that just shows you, although it was very dangerous for Putin to allow Prigozhin to go unpunished after his mutiny in June, uh, it will also have some dangers uh, if he has now ordered him to be killed, if that is what's happened, um, because that will have a backlash amongst those ultra-nationalist pro-war constituencies that were so fond of Prigozhin and his Wagner group. Shashang, let's just take those two bits separately and then bring them together if we can. First of all, the fact that, as you say, these uh, Wagner telegram groups are all saying unanimously that um, he has died. You monitor these kind of things. I mean, how... How trustworthy, how much credence can you give to them? Is it the fact that they're all saying the same thing, the fact, the, the reason why we should perhaps believe them? Yes, they're untrustworthy. The, um, these are, you know, ultra-nationalist, hardline bloggers. Um, but just as we look at them closely to understand that if they say there have been military setbacks for Russia in Ukraine, you know that there's probably something to it. In the same way, if they are acknowledging that their uh, leader, Prigozhin, uh, has died, uh, or indeed if that's what they believe, that's the important thing. Um, and it's not just Prigozhin, of course. Uh, it will also be, uh, it's a great importance that on the passenger manifest published by the Russian Aviation Authority is also Dmitry Utkin. Uh, Utkin, if you've ever seen a picture of him, is a very distinctive looking character, mm. sort of big, bulging, full of Nazi tattoos, uh, and he was the original founder of the Wagner Group. Indeed, he was reported to be at the uh, command of the Wagner column that was marching on Moscow as part of that mutiny, while Prigozhin himself was remaining in Rostov, closer to the Ukraine border. So uh, that also is going to rile up these people considerably. Yes, Utkin with the SS tattoos on his uh, collarbones. And, and now the other part of what you said, Shashank, from these Telegram channels, that they are blaming... Uh, the Russian state. What does what does that mean, and what does that mean for for Putin and his uh, defence ministry? I think it shows you there are still some quite serious political tensions amongst Russia's um, military apparatus. Uh, what happened is not to give too long a story, but Prigozhin increasingly uh, cast his attacks against Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defence minister, and Valery Gerasimov, the country's chief of general staff, the top general, painting them as incompetent. What happened after the coup is that we saw a kind of consolidation of authority. I think it's notable, for example, that today of all days, we saw Sergei Sorovikin, General Sergei Sorovikin, the uh, former commander of Russian forces in Ukraine and uh, someone who was put under house arrest for being associated with Prigozhin. He was relieved of his command as head of the Russian Air Force today. So, mm. in other words, the Russian Defense Ministry had been attempting to consolidate its control of these unruly dissenting elements, including the nationalist bloggers and the hardline critics. What I think has happened today is that that process has continued, but it may also unleash forces that could uh, have unpredictable consequences for the leadership, because we still have, of course, Wagner Group still has thousands of people under arms, uh, not all of them on the front lines in Ukraine, very few of them on, in the, on the front lines in Ukraine, but I think there are still lots of people who will have uh, simmering grievances as a result of this for a very, very long time to come. 
Yeah, it does feel like a long time ago this morning that I read about Surovikin having been removed a lot. Seems to have happened since that point. Um, Shashan, you will have looked at the footage as we have. Um, what do you make of, of that jet as it, as it comes down? Are we able to draw anything as uh, any of the um, channels that you're following on social media indicating how, in fact, that Embraer jet, which is very safe, as reporting suggests, how it did, in fact, come down? Uh, well, there have been some indications from eyewitnesses uh, that there were explosive noises <clears throat> prior to the descent of the jet. There are some other suggestions that the um, uh, smoke trails visible in the images are suggestive of a surface-to-air missile. I'm not competent to judge that. I think we'd need to hear the view of a technical expert to, to judge whether those claims are credible. But what I will say is, when I first heard of this crash, my first thought was, is this an accident? Because uh, I will say since May 3rd, there have been 15 Ukrainian drone attacks on Moscow and the surrounding region, including attacks on seven consecutive nights uh, as of yesterday. And so I thought, is this a situation like the one we saw in Iran back in January 2020, where air defense operators around Moscow have got twitchy and they've taken down a jet? I think that's highly unlikely. This was daylight. This was a well-used route. Um, and it seems to me exceedingly improbable that the first plane to be taken down by Russian air defense ought to be the one carrying Evgeny Prigozhin. Um, so if this was a surface-to-air missile, and I, I'm, I stress I can't confirm that in any way, uh, then I, I have to say I'd be very hard-pressed to conclude anything other than the fact that this was a deliberate uh, choice, uh, almost certainly ordered by the Kremlin in the same way uh, of many other assassinations over the years. Ha, and you would go as far as uh, laying this at the door of the Kremlin, because, of course, there, as we've been reporting, uh, as Professor Clark told us and Christopher Steele told us earlier, there has been a contract out on Prigozhin's head and uh, many um, influential people in Moscow have wanted this man dead. I, I think of this more broadly uh, when we have these debates around attempted assassinations or assassinations like the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko or Sergei Skripal or indeed Alexei Navalny. Um, what we always see from the Russian state is an attempt to try and muddy the waters and diffuse responsibility and the suggestion that actually anyone could have done this. It could have been organized crime. And in a way, Russia uh, leverages, the Russian state leverages its status as a kind of mafia state uh, with organized crime wielding considerable power to try and displace blame onto other potential parts of the, the regime or uh, those affiliated with it. I ultimately think that is improbable, not mm. least because this is not Novichok. This is this would be an air, a surface-to-air missile system. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me a completely uh, improbable, uh, unpersuasive that this could have been any sort of rogue operation if it was a, uh, a, a missile that shot down the plane. Uh, and that is what, of course, we will try and ascertain in the coming hours, days, weeks, perhaps months, years, as uh, this story continues. All right, Shashank, really do appreciate your analysis. It's, uh, it was great to have you on. Thank you very much. Shashank Thank Joshi you. there, uh, defence analyst from The Economist. Now, earlier, as uh, the news of this plane crash was breaking, my colleague Sally Lockwood was able to speak to Christopher Steele. Now, he once ran the Russia desk at MI6, and he said it'd be a mistake to jump to conclusions about Putin's involvement in Prigozhin's plane crash. Nothing like a peaceful August afternoon in Russia. Um, yes, I think we absolutely saw this coming. I think that Putin's indulgence of Prigozhin, both before and in fact after the coup attempt, was a was big big surprise. And also, I think importantly, it was deeply unpopular amongst the the security elite around Putin. One of the things that we've been aware of for some time is just how divisive a figure Prigozhin had become amongst the elite. Uh, he spent most of last autumn trying to topple the governor of St. Petersburg, which of course is Putin's hometown, Biglov, um, and failed and to take over the economy there. And then we, we hear source reporting telling us that Nikolai Patrashev, for example, who is a very powerful figure in the regime, Secretary of the Security Council, uh, was a sworn enemy uh, of Prigozhin. So I think that in a sense, this isn't a surprise. I think it would be a mistake to jump to the conclusion that it's an operation that was um, launched and, and, and authorized by Putin himself. But certainly, I think it looks as though it may well be um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard 
some weeks ago from a source that a contract had in fact been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business community. So I think there'll be quite a lot to, to play out here yet. For anyone just joining us, uh, you're watching the news hour on Sky News. Uh, we are covering this breaking news coming out of Russia that 10 people have been killed in a private jet crash north of Moscow. The Russian Civil Av Aviation Authority is saying that Evgeny Prigozhin was on the passenger list. Uh, reports also that everyone on board has been killed. Uh, Christopher Steele, uh, I mean, this mutiny that we saw back in June, we discussed this together at the time, and, and it did present the greatest threat to Vladimir Putin since he came to power more than 20 years ago. There was a lot of speculation at the time uh, that Evgeny Prigozhin would meet an untimely end, but many also thought that he might be pr protected given his power and influence when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Um, what is your take on all of that? My take was at the time that, that Prigozhin thought he was indispensable to Putin because of his foreign ties and all the wealth and so on in Africa that he was controlling, much of which the elite needs to evade Western sanctions. Uh, and it looked for a while as though he was actually um, indispensable to Putin in that regard. But of course, I think he's been behaving quite provocatively by turning up at the Africa summit and things like this. And I, I just think that, it, it, that in Russia, um, these things have a habit of, of biting back. And um, yeah, as I say, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that this has happened. But I think whoever was behind it, this may be more complicated than some Putin ordered state operation. I think we just have to wait and see. Christopher Still, former head of the Russia desk at MI6. We'll have more, of course, on this story after the break, and uh, we'll get the thoughts again of our military analyst, Professor Michael Clark Stevens. It is an absolutely historic moment. It's the first womb transplant in the UK. Wonderful, exciting step forward in science and for fertility medicine. You know, it's it's the dawn of a new era, and. It's going to give so much hope to those women who, as you said, may have been born without a womb or um, they may have had hysterectomy because of having cancer or large fibroids or severe endometriosis. And it's really significant for those women because up to now they've had very, very limited options um, for them to become mums. Really, there was no other way of helping them apart from fertility treatment followed by surrogacy or by considering adoption. But womb transplants are an absolute game changer. You know, this is the only opportunity for women born without a womb who've had um, a hysterectomy to carry their own baby. This is very complex surgery. But when you look at the statistics from around the world, because we're not the first in the UK to do this surgery, um, it's still in its infancy. It's um, uh, not yet 10 years since, since the first um, uterus transplant, but there have been around 100 transplants and, and there are thought to be around um, 50 babies that have been born. So there really is hope on the horizon. It can actually work. You know, it, it is very complex surgery, but it really can work. We know as the national charity that infertility um, is uh, terribly distressing. We know 50% of people who are uh, infertile are um, depressed. And we also know that 40% of people who are um, infertile are suicidal. 10% of those uh, say that they feel suicidal. Um, all of the time. Going forward, Fertility Network, um, as the National Fertility Charity, we do have questions um, about this, and our questions are about cost and availability. Um, at the moment, um, this is the first um, womb transplant in the UK, and it's part of a trial. Uh, there are 10 women involved in the trial, so it's going to be another um, few years before the trial ends. But at the end of this trial, who is um, this technology going to be available for? Um, is it going to be funded on the NHS? It is very costly surgery because if it isn't available on the NHS, then, then where are the benefits for fertility patients?
watching Sky News and our continuing coverage of that plane crash in Russia, a plane uh, that was carrying the head of Wagner, Evgeny Prigozhin, and his second in command, uh, Dmitry uh, Utkin. Uh, our defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark, is here with us for his thoughts on uh, what we have seen this evening. And, and Professor Clark, as, as we say, um, the Russian Civil Aviation Authority are confirming that these two men were on board that plane and that the plane has crashed, but no confirmation yet that they have died. Yeah, I mean, one of the very interesting things about this, Kamali, which we kind of miss in the, in the drama of the, the plane crash and apparent deaths, is the fact that this was, the plane was coming in and, in and out of Moscow. Hmm. I mean, this is Prigozhin, who uh, set up a, what looked like an armed rebellion on the 24th of June, seems to have got away with it, was, was, uh, was sent off to Belarus in some sort of vague agreement, and then was back and forth to Petersburg and Moscow. He turned up in Moscow more than once, Petersburg more than once, more, more, he was there more than he was ever in Belarus, as far as we could tell. And this man was leading a, a, an extraordinarily sort of normal life for somebody who'd been branded a traitor, and, and Putin, of course, is extremely indecisive. And Putin was just saying nothing about this. Mm. Uh, and he, he was made to look weak by that uh, apparent coup on the 24th of June. And he, uh, he's flip-flopped ever since. It's not yeah. clear what his attitude was. And, of course, people will say, oh, well, Putin's now killed him, he was a dead man walking, and, you know, there it is. Um, I'm not even sure that will turn out to be true. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. But Putin has never, since the beginning of this war, Putin has never acted decisively. He's extremely indecisive, which is what happens to dictators. When they've been in power for a long time, they find it difficult to take any decisions. Yeah, and they're being told, uh, of course, what they want to hear. And Indeed. oftentimes that uh, information is not as useful as they would like it to be. Now, uh, let's uh, just reflect as well on the fact that the second in command of Wagner may well have been on this uh, plane as well that has crashed. Dmitry Utkin, what do we know about this man? Yeah, I mean, Utkin is a co-founder of, uh, of the whole organisation. Um, he, ten he tended to command outside of, of Russia and outside of, of Ukraine. Um, a lot of experience in Middle East and Africa. Uh, again, like all of the founders, other than Prigozhin himself, I mean, he had military experience. I mean, these people were, you know, were, you knew what they were doing in military terms, and Prigozhin was just the, you know, the big entrepreneur mm. who could make these things work in, in other ways. And Utkin was a sort of shadowy figure, but people in Wagner respected him, and it was thought when Prigozhin uh, committed this coup and, and uh, was seemed to be sidelined, maybe, that Utkin might arise. But Utkin stuck with Prigozhin, and Utkin was said to be in Belarus, in Azerbaijan. And when they were pulling people together in Azerbaijan, it is said that Utkin said, um, we're off to Africa, boys, welcome to hell. <laughs> we're going there and we're going to, you know, make our fortunes in Africa. Yeah. And to be honest, whether he said it or not, he should have, because that's exactly the attitude he had to most things. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting as well, when we speak to Shasha and Joshi just a little while ago, him saying that all of the pro-Wagner telegram channels are now reporting this as, as being confirmed that these men are dead and, and laying the blame squarely at uh, those in the Kremlin. Yes, I'm sure that will be true. I mean, Wagner has, has diverged further and further from the Kremlin since this war began. I mean, Wagner were involved in, in three operations um, in the war. It's at Popasna, at Severodonetsk, mm. and then at Bakhmut. And they've lost, by their own admission, about uh, 50 to 60,000 wow. troops. I mean, casualties. I mean, 25,000 dead and uh, 30, 35,000... Um, uh, injured, wounded, and they blame constantly the, the Ministry of Defence in Moscow um, for inadequacies, for lack of ammunition and so on. And some people said, no, look, I've, I've spoken to troops in, in uh, Ukraine who say, look, they've got plenty of ammunition. They're, you know, Wagner have been, have been bombing us, they've been artillery uh, shelling us all day long, all day, every day. They're not short of artillery shells. But the, 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 the point that was being made always, that Wagner had been let down by the regulars, mm. Um, and they diverged further and further, and Putin was unable to, to bring them together. He tried once, around about February, to actually create a sort of a, 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 an arrangement between Wagner and the Ministry of Defence, and it didn't last very long, it only lasted a couple of weeks, and, you know, they just got further and further away. So there is no love lost whatsoever between Wagner and the Ministry of Defence, which is why, whatever happens to Wagner now, they will not, I can promise you, become part of the regular forces. They'll all make their own decisions, and they'll probably split up into different things, and the regular will carry on as they're going to do. OK, final thought from you, Michael, before we uh, get to the top of the hour. Where does this leave President Putin tonight? You said that he's a man who has been indecisive since he launched yeah. this invasion. Um, if he is behind the ordering of this, the downing of this jet, he will have wanted to be seen to act decisively in this instance and in removing uh, 
an irritant in his yep. in his side. Yep. Um, but where does it leave him? Leave him in the way that people will see yeah. his decision making. He might, whether he's behind it or not, he might want to be seen to be behind it because it makes him look tough. I mean, like any gang leader, like any gangster, he wants to be the head of the family and, and show that he commands respect. The problem is that Wagner is not going to go away, and it's not going to like him, and it's not going to be part of his armed forces structure. And so he's still got a problem with Wagner, even though he's, he's been getting money from Wagner for a long time. So it still leaves him, as it were, hopping between different stools in the way he, com he commands his military, who he can rely on and who he can't. Mm. And, I mean, you know, the, the, the Kremlin is ablaze with rumours um, in the last couple of months since this coup. And those rumours didn't take, didn't happen before. They're all happening now. It certainly are. Right, Michael Clark, really appreciate your analysis as always. Coming up at Sky News at 10, we'll have the latest on that plane crash outside Moscow, the plane that was carrying Evgeny Prigozhin. It is 10 o'clock, this is Sky News at 10, our top story. Evgeny Prigozhin, the man who masterminded Wagner's march on Moscow, believed to be involved in a plane crash. 
The private jet brought down between Moscow and St. Petersburg with Prigozhin named on the passenger list. President Putin busy tonight presenting medals at a military concert while President Biden hints at what may have happened to the Wagner leader. There is not much that happens when Russia is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. Also tonight, Rudy Giuliani surrenders to authorities in Georgia on charges that he helps Donald Trump try to subvert the 2020 election. India's successful lunar landing joy and relief for mission control as the country now plans to send astronauts to the moon. India's successful moon mission is not just India's alone. This success belongs to all of humanity. Plus, the survivors of the Pakistan cable car rescue reveal how they feared for their lives stranded 900 feet above a ravine. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. The man who masterminded an attempted coup against President Putin has been declared dead by Russian authorities. Evgeny Prigozhin, leader of the mercenary group, the Wagner Group, and a longtime ally of the Russian president until the ill-fated march on Moscow in June, was named as a passenger on a private jet which crashed on its way from the Russian capital to St. Petersburg. However, it remains unconfirmed tonight if Prigozhin was actually on board, despite a pro-Wagner social media channel proclaiming both the mercenary leader and the founder of the group, Dmitry Utkin, to have died. Now, the plane is believed to have crashed in the northern area of the Tver region, approximately 60 miles north of Moscow. There are not to believe to be any survivors on board. Our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, has tonight's first report from Russia. First, there is just a plume of white smoke, and then it is clear it's a plane tumbling out of the sky. Russia's aviation authority says Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin was killed on that plane, a man who, since he set his men on Moscow two months ago, was perhaps Putin's enemy number one, however the Kremlin liked to spin it. He and his number two, Dmitry Utkin, now apparently both come to a sticky end. That's if the Russian authorities are to be believed. <laughs> this moment and the 24 hours preceding it in Rostov-on-Don in June were unforgivable for Vladimir Putin, an act of mutiny by the Wagner leader against Russia's top military command, then calling his men off halfway to the capital in exchange for supposed exile in Belarus. But it didn't seem much like exile. Prigozhin popping up in St. Petersburg, hobnobbing with African dignitaries and continuing to rail against the way the Ukraine war was being run from Belarus. The last we saw of him was this video published earlier in the week, most probably in the African Sahel, where Prigozhin said that Wagner would make Russia even greater and Africa even more free. But his days were likely numbered. It looks as though it may well be... Um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard some weeks ago from a source that a contract had in fact been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business communities. As the news broke, President Putin appeared at a commemorative event for the World War II battle at Kursk, holding a minute silence for the Soviet dead as the wreckage of the plane burned. From the US, President Biden had this to say. I don't know for a fact what happened, but I'm not surprised. There's not much that happens when Russia is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. No doubt clarity will be a long time coming. But Prigozhin is a man who courts attention. And if he is not dead, then we will likely hear from him soon. And if he is, there will be no tears shed in the Kremlin. And we can speak to Diana now, who is in Russia for us. So, Diana, what more do we know about whether or not Prigozhin was actually on board that flight? Well, we do have confirmation from the uh, aviation authority that not just Yevgeny Prigozhin, but also his security chief, Valery Shakalov, and his number two, his deputy, Dmitry Utkin, who Wagner was actually named after because of his 
uh, appreciation for the German conductor. Um, he, they all three were on board, and that is essentially the top echelons of uh, the Wagner Group uh, taken out in one fell swoop. And it is exactly two months to the day that Prigozhin launched his uh, very short-lived mutiny on Moscow. Uh, and promptly called it off the next day after intense mediation from the Belarusian leader, Alexander Lukashenko. And I think there has been a great deal of speculation since then as to why he appeared to be getting away with it scot-free, President Putin having vowed vengeance on traitors um, uh, on the day after the mutiny was launched and then dropping all charges against Prigozhin. Prigozhin did not seem to be treading carefully over the last few weeks either, continuing to be as outspoken as we've heard him before about what he thought uh, about the war in Ukraine um, and continuing seemingly to have free passage on Russian soil. Um, and now we have this, uh, this incredible turn in circumstances, but, but one perhaps that uh, many had expected, that his days were numbered and that if you stand up like that against the Kremlin, even if you say that it's not against the Kremlin, it's, it's against Russia's top military command, then you will have your comeuppance. Now, the authorities have launched a criminal investigation. They are trying to find out whether safety features may have been at fault. But there is, as you can imagine, a whole lot of speculation roaming the Russian telegram as well as social media more generally about what, in fact, went, went on, whether it was brought down by air defence, whether uh, some uh, package was presented to uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin before he left. And I think um, we won't know for a long time to come. But we do understand this has now uh, been confirmed by the aviation authorities that, uh, that uh, both that, that, that Prigozhin, Otkin and his security chief have all died in that crash. And Diana, you mentioned there the social media channels, the Telegram channels that are reporting this and many of those pro Wagner groups blaming the Kremlin for this. But I, I wonder how this has been received on Russian state television. Is it being reported there? And what's been the reaction? It is being reported. Um, uh, much more straight than you'll find on some of Wagner channels. Although I, I don't think you're finding on Wagner channels blaming the Kremlin. You're just... Um, finding at the moment sort of condolences about um, what has uh, happened and that their leader is gone. Um, State TV are playing it straight. Uh, they have to uh, use the official version. Um, there is some talk on uh, state channels that this could have been, that this was a terrorist act um, initiated by uh, Ukraine. We shall have to see how those narratives evolve, but I'm sure there will be plenty of them. OK, Diana... For now, thank you very much for that. Well, let's bring in our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, as well as our security and defence uh, expert, Professor Michael Clark. Uh, Dominic, Michael, thank you very much for being with us. Now, Dominic, uh, you were in Ukraine at the time of uh, Prigozhin's um, failed mutiny. Uh, what do you think will be the reaction there now to this news. Yeah, and that, that was an extraordinary day. It was a day where the Ukrainians sort of began, allowed themselves to hope that uh, Putin's misadventure in Ukraine could lead to Russians turning on themselves. And of course, they were bitterly disappointed when it, when it didn't. I think the satisfaction in Ukraine uh, that Prigozhin um, is likely to be uh, dead, not just because of who he was, because he brought thousands of Russian prisoners from prisons, evil men with terrible criminal records to Ukraine to to kill Ukrainians, he also kind of um, held the movement, the Wagner movement together, which was a very effective fighting force, the most effective fighting force really the Russians have had in this, in this war. Um, and he kind of, I think, articulated some of the concerns the Russians had. So I think they'll be, they'll be hopeful that his demise will lead to lower morale in the Russian army. But that's really only relevant, really, when the Russians are in attack, mm. and they're not anymore, they're in defence. They're hunkered down in the Surovikin line, named after the general who today has been relieved of his duties because he's believed to have been too close to Prigozhin. And I think the Ukrainians know that the defences that he put in place, a lot of mines concentric lines of defences so far have been impregnable to their attempts to try and puncture through. And they're being expected by the West to do something uh, which has not really been done in the history of war, which is to puncture through that with, with armour without the, uh, the use of air power. Mm. So I think their concern is that, you know, he, he's gone, but the war seems to be heading towards possibly a stalemate where Russians will have 
control of a lot of their country still uh, indefinitely. And he may be dead, but I think in their minds there are plenty more monsters where Pogodin came from. Yeah, certainly are. That uh, counter-offensive hasn't had the effect that it's had that they wanted. Uh, uh, Michael, you've been looking at the Wagner um, social media channels. Uh, what are they saying may well be the, the future of that mercenary yeah. group? Um, well, I mean, Wagner, the Grey Zone channels are very clear that, uh, that Pogodin and Udkin are dead. There's also lots of stuff coming out. Lot, this is set off so many hairs, you can imagine. There is there's stuff coming out in the last hour that Nelution 76 has landed in Belarus and is taking Wagner people out of Belarus. Oh. Um, and that's also being confirmed by some of the Belarusian opposition groups who are more reliable in what they're looking at. Also, there's rumours that in Rostov... You remember Rostov in, the, in, the, in that apparent coup on the 24th of June? took. I mean, Rostov was, was on fate. Uh, when Prigozhin and the Wagner people left. They, people were cheering in the streets. Yeah. Rostov, it's, it is said, is in a state of ferment this evening. Now, that oh. may turn out not to be true. We don't know. But, but there are all sorts of, of rumours kicking around because this is like throwing a stone into the pond. You know, I mean, Prigozhin might have been very, very unpopular with the elite, as we were talking about before, but he had a lot of, of support among a lot of Russians because he seemed to speak the truth, he seemed to relate to people. I know he's a brutal man. I mean, he was the man who invented the sledgehammer as the symbol for, uh, for Wagner because that's how they killed the deserters, with a sledgehammer to the head. Mm -hmm. And he was very proud of that. He was a brutal man. But he had a certain sort of connection with a lot of ordinary Russians. He certainly did. OK, Professor Clark, Dominic, thank you very much for that. Now, the plane crash comes exactly two months after, as we were talking, Pogosian's failed mutiny, prompting suggestions of Kremlin involvement. Now, Pogosian was the figurehead of the Wagner Group and was at one time known as Putin's chef, with influence that stretch way beyond Russia's borders. But what next for the mercenaries who've been so profitable for the Russian leader? Here is Dominic's report. To a gangster president, he was the perfect henchman. Loyal, resourceful and brutally violent. Yevgeny Prigozhin was a common criminal turned caterer for the Kremlin. Putin's chef, they called him. But he was useful for so much more, serving up the means for one special mission after another. Prigozhin's Wagner group of mercenaries did the president's dirty work for him, subverting American democracy, cyber meddling propping up regimes in Africa in return for lucrative diamond concessions. And when Putin's disastrous war in Ukraine went so badly wrong, he called on Yevgeny Prigozhin again. Wagner pulled off one of the only Russian successes in this war, the capture of the city of Bakhmut. Putin raised Prigozhin up and has now, it seems, destroyed his creature, who turned against him. The crass mishandling of the war by Russia's military leadership infuriated Prigozhin. His rants against them grew more and more angry. Then in one of the most dramatic episodes of this war, he launched a mutiny against them, seizing military headquarters, sending his forces north to march on Moscow. But his rebellion gathered no support. By nightfall, he'd called it off. His fate was now deeply uncertain. The dictator who said he negotiated the end of the coup dismissed claims that Prigozhin was a marked man, about to be whacked in his words. But his powers being eroded, his headquarters raided, comical pictures of him in fancy dress released to the media. His appearances became increasingly sporadic and pathetic. No one should be sentimental about Yevgeny Prigozhin. He was a criminal and a ruthless killer. His favourite means of execution, crushing victims' skulls with a sledgehammer. If he has now been killed by the man who made him in the gangster politics of Putin's Russia, it is a suitably violent ending. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News. Now, Rudy Giuliani has arrived in Atlanta, Georgia, where he has handed himself over to authorities on charges of conspiring to overturn the 2020 presidential election in a scene that is set to be repeated by former President Donald Trump tomorrow. Giuliani is a former mayor of New York and faces 13 charges in this case. Let's go straight to our US correspondent, Mark Stone, who's outside the courthouse. Mark, good to have you with us. So we've seen the reaction so far from President Biden on that Prigozhin news, first of all. Is there likely to be any more reaction from the White House? 
Yes, we'll talk about the, the Trump circus, and that's what it is uh, down here in a moment. But first of all, uh, yeah, not much more from, from what Joe Biden said on the news about, about Prigozhin. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, President Biden, is on holiday at the moment in California, uh, but we are told that he was briefed in detail as much as they know uh, about what happened. Uh, and you saw his brief statement in Diana's report. I have spoken to the National Security Council uh, spokesperson up in Washington. Uh, they say simply that if confirmed, no one should be surprised this disastrous war in Ukraine led to a private army marching on Moscow and now it would seem to this but look I think they're watching this very closely trying to confirm themselves precisely what happened certainly will be and Mark you're, as you say you're in Georgia ahead of Trump's indictment tomorrow but we've seen his former lawyer Giuliani hand himself over to authorities today yes I, I think if you were looking for a out or at least view the madness that is American politics um, right now. Well, today, tomorrow, the next couple of days are a good moment uh, to tune in because we are seeing multiple different events now which I think reflect that madness. This afternoon here at Fulton County Jail, just north of the downtown area of, of Atlanta, we saw the former president's former lawyer, uh, the former mayor of New York, a man who was once well respected uh, across the country, walking in uh, to the jail to surrender himself, to be formally arrested and, as you can see, to be mugshotted uh, as well. Uh, that scene will be repeated tomorrow with the president uh, himself. Have a listen, have a listen to what the, the former mayor said uh, as he came out. Uh, from the jail. I'm being prosecuted for defending an American citizen who uh, I do as a lawyer. And uh, five other lawyers are indicted. That should tell you right away that this is a, an assault on our Constitution. A witch hunt, uh, he has said throughout, uh, and that we will hear that repeated tomorrow. When the spectacle will only grow, that image of, of a former president walking uh, or driving, we don't yet know, uh, into a jail, a notorious jail, uh, this one is, uh, to surrender himself as a result of that fourth indictment. And it's not just that, because tonight, uh, overnight your time, we will see Donald Trump uh, talking to his friend turned foe, turned friend again, Tucker Carlson, uh, in an exclusive interview, he's doing that because he snubbed the Republican de Party debate. The other candidates, they will be debating uh, in Milwaukee. So much going on. It's pretty mad. All right, Mark, for now, in Georgia, thank you for that. Now, India has made history and become the first nation to land near the South Pole of the Moon. There's been joy and relief for millions across the entire country with the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, hailing it as a success for the whole of humanity. Now, the successful mission makes India a member of an elite club, only the fourth country to achieve a moon landing and comes after a similar Russian mission crashed into the lunar surface just a few days ago. Here's our India correspondent, Neville Lazarus. The tension is palpable. The sensors that are updating at this point are providing confirmation of the safety of the landing site. A heart-stopping moment for everyone watching this, as the lander Vikram descends softly on the southern face of the moon. <laughs> Jubilation all around. Sir, we have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. A surge in the national pride as India joins the table as a key player in the global community of space exploration. It's only the fourth country after the United States, former Soviet Union and China to have a spacecraft land on the moon, but the first to be on the southern side. India's successful moon mission is not just India's alone. This success belongs to all of humanity. And assembly between the S-200... India's moon mission has been in the making for 15 years. And it comes just days after a Russian spacecraft crashed in its attempt to reach the southern side. Scientists believe that craters there may contain frozen water the detection of which could potentially support a permanent base on the moon. 
the earlier moon missions were about adventure. Uh, the present moon missions are uh, looking at minerals, water, etc., thinking in terms of, like we have in Antarctica today on Earth, a science mission based there which would continue to do science. The cost of Chandrayaan-3 was $74 million, less than half the cost of the Hollywood blockbuster Interstellar. Now India must strike a balance between growing its investment in space and meeting the demands of the millions of its citizens living in poverty. But there's no doubt today's pioneering moment and unprecedented success cements India's position as a major player in the space race. Never Lazarus, Sky News, Delhi. Across the border now, and some of those saved from the cable car in Pakistan have spoken of their relief at being brought to safety. They were on their way to school when one of the cables supporting the car they were in snapped. It led to an audacious rescue 900 feet above a ravine which involved a helicopter, zip wires and pulleys and lasted several painstaking hours. Saba Chowdhury reports. This was the high wire drama watched by the world. These boys, 900 feet above a ravine, here, clinging on for dear life. The scenery, a distraction from the ugly fate they feared the most. But miraculously, they survived, and what's left of their ordeal is still hanging today in the valleys of Hyberipokthankhwa. A stark reminder of what could have been. Here, you can see where a cable snapped, leaving school children, like 13-year-old Imran, stranded and terrified. When the cable car was stuck in between, it was a very horrific moment. Everyone was so scared. We were thinking that our time has come. We were thinking we'd either survive or not. His school journeys will never be the same again. I will never, ever again sit in a cable car. I will prefer to go by foot. We really need roads to connect us. The last survivors were brought to safety on a line, confused and exhausted. Their school friends are reeling from what they witnessed and what some very narrowly avoided. Yesterday I came to school on the same cable car and when I was at assembly, I heard about the incident. We immediately go to the spot and we saw that one rope was broken. My classmates were just hanging there. A valley that was gripped by fear is now overcome with relief and gratitude. But many will have to make that journey again. Sabah Chowdhury, Sky News. Now, South Yorkshire Police has apologised after losing nearly three years' worth of video evidence. The force believes the footage, which was recorded by officer worn body cameras, has been deleted. It's estimated 69 cases have been affected. The police force has referred itself to the Information Commissioner's Office and is attempting to recover the lost data. It's claimed that the majority of Wilco stores are going to shut in the next week after a purchase of the retailer fell through. The GMB say they've been told by administrators there's no prospect of saving the business which employs some 12,000 workers. Now, it is a medical milestone that provides hope for many women who aren't able to carry their own children. Doctors in Oxford successfully conducted the UK's first womb transplant on a 30-year-old woman, 34-year-old woman, sorry, using the uterus of her older sister. Sky News has spoken to a woman in Texas who had her womb transplant in 2018 and has since had two babies thanks to the procedure. Edna Robinson reports. What happened on this operating table has offered up a new world of fertility possibilities in the UK. The moment a uterus is transferred from one sister to another, the country's very first successful womb transplant. I just felt less and broken and confused and like, why me? Come here. It's a breakthrough for people like Ella May, who had a devastating diagnosis at 16 of MRKH syndrome, born without a womb. For me, it was just that utter, like, I now can't talk about this, and this is, like, this is my big secret, and my body is now secret type thing. So, yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> 
It's OK. It's a lot to talk about it. Mm. Is it bringing it back? Yeah, loads. It's weird. I don't, I'm, I'm such an advocate for it and you don't realise until you go back into those memories what you felt at the time. But now, a new potential. Being in a long-term relationship, we want to have kids. Um, and if that was an option on the table, it would be a, a, a beautiful thing. It would just be, it would have a lot of thought process, personally, for me behind it, as I'm sure it, anyone that's gone through with it. Because um, of the risks. Because of the risks and the, um, and the, and yeah, just the things that could happen. The transplant took this medical team 17 hours. Their patient now planning on having children through IVF. In 2018 in the US, Madison did just that and now has two. I can't even describe words, can't even describe um, how, how much of an amazing experience it was um, to hear the first cry of both babies and to see them like outside of my body for the first time and to just realize like, I went through this. I got to carry them. I got the privilege of getting to have the transplant, of getting to carry these beautiful babies. The transplant's expected to last for five years. Then the womb removed, a risky, long process benefiting a small number. You need extensive counselling, and both not just the recipient, uh, both the partner and the donor, of course. It is uh, a large or a, a big procedure, but the human body is fantastic and can recover. Ethical questions aside, it's a remarkable technical achievement for UK surgeons. Not a life-saving transplant, but a life-making transplant. Adele Robinson, Sky News. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow morning's newspapers in our press preview. Tonight, we're joined by our defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark, as well as the Daily Mirror's political editor, John Stevens, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. Now, among the stories we'll be discussing is this one on the front of the eye. Their headline, Putin critic killed 60 days after mutiny.
Well, you're watching uh, Sky News in just a moment. The press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. But first, our top stories. Evgeny Prigozhin, the man who masterminded Wagner's march on Moscow, is believed to have been on board a private jet which crashed just outside the Russian capital. Rudy Giuliani surrenders to authorities in Georgia on charge that he helped Donald Trump try and subvert the 2020 election there. And India has made history as its moon mission becomes the first to land in the lunar South Pole region. Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what is making headlines with our defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark, as well as the Daily Mirror's political editor, John Stevens, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. We'll hear from them in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at some of those front pages, all dominated by that plane crash involving Evgeny Prigozhin. This is the headline of the eye. Putin critic killed 60 days after mutiny. The Financial Times also carries confirmation that Prigozhin died in the crash. The Guardian says that the Wagner chief is reported dead. The Daily Mail asks whether the crash was an act of revenge by Putin, while the Express also suggests the crash was a result of Prigozhin's attempted mutiny, calling it no surprise. The Daily Star also appears sceptical that the crash was an accident, with the headline, What Rotten Luck. Now, the Metro has India over the moon as they've become the fourth nation to make a lunar landing. And a reminder, by scanning the QR code you see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of the papers while you watch along with us. Now, tonight, as I said, we're joined by Professor Michael Clark, John Stevens, and Sarah Vine, and there they all are. Guys, it's great to have you all in the studio. And as one story, of course, dominating, let's start with the front of the ice, Sarah, and uh, that shot there of Prigozhin, yes. uh, purportedly taken when he was in Africa just a couple of days ago. Well, that's what... That, that's what. Well, I was just asking Michael, who knows everything about the story, and he said that they weren't really sure that he was in Africa, and you thought that he probably was wearing too many clothes for a man who was supposedly standing <laughs> he was supposed around... To be 50 degrees. 50 degrees. So very overdressed. Yes, he's slightly overdressed for the occasion. I've never seen a commander wear that sort of com uh, yeah. camo outfit in that sort of heat. And also, he doesn't seem to be sweating at all, so maybe it was in Africa. Yeah. Um, but, yes, I mean, we, but, 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 I mean, already, we don't really know what's happened. No. Or, you know, he's on the flight list, he was on the flight list, there were two aeroplanes, Planes. One of them has come down. He was on the flight list with his deputy. Mm. See, I think Wicked, yeah. I think that's a bit fishy because I think if you're in, if you're Mr. Warlord, you don't travel with your deputy, do you? Because what happens if the plane goes down? You're both dead. Absolutely. I mean, Michael, is that right? Would you travel yeah. in separate planes? I mean, the interesting thing as well is that they said ten were on board and yeah. they recovered eight bodies, which yeah. leaves yeah. two. Yeah. I mean, you know, this story will, will just keep rolling for a couple of days. More and more details will come out. And so the papers are going with what they've got, which is, you know, all that we know is that aircraft come down, he's identified as being dead, Udkin seems to be dead. Uh, the uh, Wagner channels are saying Udkin's dead as well, he's the deputy. If so, the, I mean, the world will be glad to see the back of these two people, but, you know, the issue goes on. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and John, I suppose that the, the question now is what sort of impact this actually ends up having on the war and, and on the, the Wagner mercenary group. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see that it's going to make a massive difference to the war. And it's perhaps... Well, it's definitely not a surprise that he's died. You know, here, you know, on the front page of the eye, it's all about killed 60 days after that mutiny. Mm. I think the surprise is that he somehow managed to last 60 days, that Putin hesitated. But how on earth, he thought, after escaping Russia, going off to exile in Belarus and then maybe going to Africa, why on earth he thought, oh, well, I'll just pop back to Russia, be absolutely fine. We're, we're over it, you know, Putin won't mind, you know, we're friends again now. Why on earth if you do that and why you would get on a private well, plane, uh, goodness knows. Uh, well, it's his jet, and Michael was saying he's been back and forth on that plane plenty of times. Yeah, well, between Petersburg and Moscow, yeah. In, in a way, you know, you say, why would you do this so casually? In a way, you're riding a tiger. You know, once once he, he crossed the line with, with uh, criticisms of the Kremlin and criticisms of Gerasimov and Shogu, um, once he'd, he'd engaged in this armed rebellion, you're riding the tiger then. You can't step off it, so you've got to keep going. And, uh, you know, he may well have had uh, intimations of what was, what was going to happen, but the, he has no alternative. You know, you, you don't give yourself a way out when you go in, in on his career path. I mean, I suppose there are two options. Either Putin's decided to kill him, 
uh, or he's decided to pretend that he's dead so that he can go and start a new life in Brazil or somewhere. In which case, we won't hear from him for I mean, a very long time. But both are quite good books. No, it'd be like... It'd be fantastic. It'd be like... Great stories. You know, he'd be turning up on the front, in the front of the sun, yeah. you know, every, once every three years in Australia on a beach. <laughs> Copacabana in his yeah, shorts. Exactly. Yeah. We've seen like Pagosi, you know. It'd be like Lord Lucan all over again. <laughs> Absolutely. It? It, really, it really could. I mean, and, and the, sort of the fascinating thing as well about this is, well, you know, the, the coup was one thing, but as Michael said, he was making a lot of noise and a lot of trouble, saying all the wrong things yeah. for weeks and months before that he actually led that abortive coup. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, his, his story is extraordinary. He was a hot dog salesman, wasn't he? Mm. He, he was sort of... Putin's he was a caterer, yeah, a caterer. But he was, a, he was an entrepreneur as well. He ran all yeah. sorts of businesses. He yeah. just had an eye for business. Yeah. And, of course, well, in Petersburg, the eye for business meant that you were also a petty criminal and you yeah. worked with the gangs. And time and inside. He, he was in yeah. prison for a number of years. He was very successful, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, and he is a fascinating character, as you say, and it uh, does remain to be seen exactly where and if he pops up again. But I suppose the, the question is what this means now for the Kremlin and, and how they decide that they're going to take this forward. Yeah, and obviously Putin's decided to get rid of him now or it looks like Putin's decided to get rid of him now. But back in the early days of that coup, when he was marching on Russia, when he was marching on Moscow and those tanks were on their way up and we're all following it on... Google Maps or whatever, it seemed like Putin was really scared of him, that he appeared on TV, did that broadcast, mm. was talking about how Russia was at risk. That is not something that somebody who is in total control and everything is going fine does. That showed that Putin was panicked. Obviously, somehow they did this deal and it's absolutely gone wrong for him. It yeah. was said that on that evening of the 24th of June that Putin hopped off with the Kovalchuk brothers, who were the two, his two friends, the banker and uh, that look after him, and then he went to their place because he didn't want to stay where he was. That may not be true, but but the rumours that Putin would not stay in the Kremlin while this march was going on were rife at the yeah. time. And the fact that those, the fact that those rumours got around shows you how much credibility Putin was losing mm. at that, that end of June because of everything that has happened with this man. Prigozhin. Do you think this restores Putin's credibility or makes him more vulnerable? I think ultimately it'll make him more vulnerable. Yeah. It might restore a certain amount of sort of mafia Bravado, credibility. This is yeah. the godfather yeah, yeah. striking back. But ultimately, it just confirms the gangster state nature of the way Russia is. I mean, and, and, and again, I mean, Putin is riding a tiger as well. He can't get off. Yeah. I mean, once you commit yourselves to these sorts of courses of action, you've got to keep on forward. You've mm. got to go to meet your, your destiny. He presents himself as a tough guy for his supporters, but, of course, the Wagner supporters are very, very upset with, with what has happened. Let's look at the front of The Guardian and, and one of the images of the, um, of the burning wreckage. There it is. Uh, uh, and, you know, we're never actually going to know the truth of what, what has happened here, are we? You know, because this has all come from Russian news agencies. These mm. are Russian-supplied pictures, and I'm not suggesting for any moment that it's been staged, but it's, it's difficult to know exactly what has taken place. And it's all come out very quickly. So that footage you, you were showing on Sky earlier, that's handheld footage taken on a farm somewhere that happened to be in the right place at the right Just time. happened to see a tiny little place. Got the mobile phone out, got <laughs> filming, and suddenly it somehow got out there very, very yeah. quickly. And it was obviously the Russian news agency was the first to be out there and say, this mm -hmm. plane has crashed. He was there on the flight logs. And I think that will create this suspicion that Russia clearly has got a storyline marked out for this. Mm. And whether they now go on to say, oh, this was Ukraine's fault, whether they continue to kind of mm. make it look like it was them, who knows? And some of the video footage that I saw earlier on today actually had dead bodies in it. So it's pretty gruesome, mm. which they will have done in order to make sure that it goes viral, which presumably it will have done. Mm. I mean, it's all quite, it's, it feels quite engineered. It does feel engineered yeah. a little bit, doesn't it? But that's all part of the misinformation, isn't it? Because we're, we're, we're not meant to be able to see behind the curtains. It's meant to be opaque. It's meant to feel like... Yeah. Are they telling us the truth? The, the, I mean, the, the Russians always have the, the standard way of dealing with all these things, um, which is that w when something happens, like the uh, uh, MH17 uh, aircraft that was brought down over the Donbass in 2014, they first of all, they just deny it outright, say it hasn't happened, it didn't happen. And then after 24 hours, they say, well, lots of complications. It's, uh, it was very complicated. And they, they draw red herrings across it all. Oh. And then after about six or eight months, they say, yeah, we did it, we did it. But you do exactly the same in the West. There's moral equivalence between us. And they always go there, you know, denial, complication, and then moral equivalent admission. And we're going to see probably something like yeah. that pr pattern with this. But the first, the, the first few things we hear from the Kremlin or from Russian agencies, I mean, you know, take it with a huge pinch of salt. Wait, wait until we've got some verification 
from our own press and mm. our own officials um, who can sort of triangulate some of this material and confirm or deny what we're going to be told from Moscow. Mm. Yeah, and it's important to be able to triangulate And just it. the drama of it all tonight with Putin there at that concert on stage. He wasn't hiding away, he was there. I mean, that is something from a TV drama. Oh, you absolutely. can just imagine the violin starting up, the music getting all orchestral, and then you kind of... I mean, this is like a movie, the plane isn't it? tumbling from the, the sky. It's the of Kursk as well. It's a hugely yeah. symbolic moment yeah. in Russian history. You know, it's yeah. a huge tank battle on the, the planes just outside Ukraine that he was there to mark. Let's look at the front page of the FT and against that picture of Prigozhin uh, there in his uh, fatigues. May or may not have been in, um, in Africa. Uh, and much of the reporting in here, Michael, is, is what you were just saying that it's going to take a while for them to try and make sure, just to verify exactly. Uh, what took place here? Yes, um, I mean, we're hearing tonight as well that uh, the Wagner Group, the command structure, are going to be making some statements. Mm. They won't be very pro-Ministry uh, of Defence statements, Moscow's Ministry of Defence, we're pretty sure, but they will be coming out with something uh, in the next few hours, and I think that, that'll probably make tomorrow night's uh, headlines, whatever they mm. choose to say about <clears throat> the future of the Wagner Group or the way they interpret all of this. But they seem to be clear in the last few hours that this is a, a strike from the Russian MOD. This is an assassination on their leaders by the official uh, Russian military and that they will be reacting to that in some way. I, mean, I suppose the question will be what the Wagner Group chooses to do, as we've been saying all evening. Many of them are in Belarus, but, of course, back on the 24th of June, some 5,000 of them led a column up towards Moscow. So there is... It's an open question as to actually how they, they may well react. Yeah, it seems like it's a full-on purge that's underway. They've got this... Russian army chief, who I'm not even trying to pronounce his Slovakian. name, but known as the General Armageddon, yeah. who also he oh, was Slovakian, kind of yeah. relieved of his duties today as well. So it feels very much that this was all one planned thing to show that Putin's back in control. Yeah, and Slovakian and Prigozhin are, are known to be close allies. I mean, there is sort of... A, a, we must not forget that there's a war being prosecuted here and some 500,000 yeah. people have died, but yeah. it does feel very much like yeah. moving people around. Kamali, they were good friends. They, they were good friends because uh, Prigozhin saved Sorovikin's bacon in Syria years ago. Sorovikin made a big mistake when he was in command and Prigozhin took the, took the blame for it. Right. He, I mean, he owed him. And they were, they were close. Uh, and, yeah, and, and Sorovikin almost certainly knew something was happening when this coup, this attempted coup, was taking place, and he didn't do anything about it. He just kept he just quiet. quiet. He had some advanced knowledge, maybe a couple of days, maybe more, mm -hmm. and he just sat on it to see what would happen. And that's been his, that's been his downfall because the Kremlin just doesn't believe that he's, he's um, on their side. So you picked something out of the FT or should we move on to the Express? No. Let's, let's move, move on, on to the, the Express, because I just, I just want to just... Uh, pick up with you, Sarah, about you know the sort of the court politics of all of this as well, because there is a lot of moving around of these kind of senior figures with all yeah, very I, difficult. I, I mean, like I said, it, it, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I don't. Will this mean the end of the Wagner Group? No, they'll no. presumably just. <clears throat> no, no. You know, I mean, they've got huge interests, and yeah. they uh, they're earning so much money in yeah. Africa, and they're so involved in Libya and Mali and uh, Ethiopia now. And you're telling uh, me earlier, Michael, they're not the only PMC private. No, military no, companies. there's twenty yeah. odd, twenty five um, private military companies yeah. of, uh, of uh, mercenaries running around in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the group will disperse, I'm sure, but the Wagner brand is now a universal yeah, brand. Yeah, and I, I just... Going. I feel very sorry for the people of Ukraine because, you know, these people are running around waving their... I can't say it on the television, can I? Waving their watsits around. You can't say that. Um, what time uh, is that? Uh, and, you know, being generally sort of obnoxious. And, and meanwhile, all these people are dying in this terrible war that is illegal and shouldn't be happening. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really difficult situation, but um, we will find out perhaps the truth of what did happen just outside Moscow in that plane crash. All right, guys, for now, thank you very much for that. Plenty more to come. Uh, there's been criticism of the uh, severance package that's been offered to the former chief exec of NatWest, who resigned over the controversy around Nigel Farage's banking affairs, and uh, we'll discuss that next. It is an absolutely historic moment. It's the first womb transplant in the UK. Wonderful, exciting step forward in science and for fertility medicine. You know, it's it's the dawn of a new era. And it's going to give so much hope to those women who, as you said, may have been born without a womb or um, they may have had hysterectomy because of having cancer or large fibroids or severe endometriosis. 
And it's really significant for those women because up to now they've had very, very limited options and for them to become mums. Really, there was no other way of helping them apart from fertility treatment followed by surrogacy or by considering adoption. But womb transplants are an absolute game changer. You know, this is the only opportunity for women born without a womb who've had um, a hysterectomy to carry their own baby. This is very complex surgery. But when you look at the statistics from around the world, because we're not the first in the UK to do this surgery, um, it's still in its infancy. It's um, uh, not yet 10 years since since the first um, uterus transplant, but there have been around 100 transplants and, and there are thought to be around um, 50 babies that have been born. So there really is hope on the horizon. It can actually work. You know, it, it is very complex surgery, but it really can work. We know as the national charity that infertility um, is uh, terribly distressing. We know 50% of people who are uh, infertile are um, depressed. And we also know that 40% of people who are um, infertile are suicidal. 10% of those uh, say that they feel suicidal. Um, all of the time. Going forward, Fertility Network, um, as the National Fertility Charity, we do have questions um, about this, and our questions are about cost and availability. Um, at the moment, um, this is the first um, womb transplant in the UK, and it's part of a trial. Uh, there are 10 women involved in the trial, so it's going to be another um, few years before the trial ends. But at the end of this trial, who is um, this technology going to be available for? Um, is it going to be funded on the NHS? It is very costly surgery because if it isn't available on the NHS, then, then where are the benefits for fertility patients? The five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview with us to discuss the morning's newspapers and the professor Michael Clark, John Stevens from the Mirror, and Sarah Vine from the Mail. All right, let's uh, dive in and look at the front page of the Metro, Sarah. Which, uh, as we were saying just before we came back, this would have been the lead story, I'm sure. Yeah. Had Prigozhin's plane not gone down. India, only the fourth nation to land something on the moon. Yes, it looks a bit like a Meccano toy from the photograph on the front page, but it is apparently <laughs> a very technical thing, and it's actually a, a triumph. For, for sort of moon technology. But Michael is the person who really knows about this because he was explaining it to me earlier. <laughs> right? Michael, tell so us. I really am going to have it's to defer Vikram to Lander, him. Correct? Yeah. And it's a lot of... I mean, the Indians had failed before with a previous attempt. The Japanese had failed, uh, the Israelis had failed, and the Russians had failed. And so they succeeded with this one. And the point is the south pole of the moon is really important mm -hmm. because there may be water there, water ice, and there's abundant sunshine, so that's the basis for a moon base. And any exploration of the solar system would have to be from a moon base. So that, to, to, get a, to get something on the south pole of the moon is first base in the exploration, and they've done it. Yeah. Other people couldn't. So scientifically, this is big news. This is and really big news. And it must be... It's a huge thing for India after... Absolutely. ..of all the nations on Earth to be able to do this right. first, right? And they're, they're, they're now the biggest country in the world. I mean, they overtook this, this year. They officially overtook China in terms of population. They've succeeded this week where the Russians failed last week. Mm. I mean, I, I dislike mm. Hendra Modri intensely on a number of grounds, but I give him today. I give him... You know, I say he's allowed today to be as triumphalist as he likes because this is a great achievement. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an achievement for, for world science. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I support that absolutely. 100% absolutely. take that point. But, I mean, the cost of it is Yes, is there has been some criticism because, I mean, India doesn't exactly have, you know, it has quite a lot of problems. 
uh, yeah, <laughs> an enormous so. amount of poverty. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's, I suppose it's a question of priorities. Yeah. I mean, with the prestige, I guess, John, of being able to land on the moon, I don't think, as Michael said, Narendra Modi is going to care that much about those criticisms at the moment. No, and obviously we know that this is an advancement, as Michael was saying, about how no one has landed in this area before. We know that obviously it's the fourth time that someone's landed on the moon, but it's the first time they've landed in this particular area. We know the scientific importance that and Michael was saying beforehand about how it's so tricky to land there that yeah. the other side of the moon where we've landed before, it's flat, it's much easier yeah. to kind of yeah, land like the down. South, South Pole of the Moon, it's like landing something in the middle of the Himalayas. Oh. Really tough. And yeah, they did a excellent work. Uh, well done to India. Let's move on now to a story that's inside the Times. And again, a story that I think may well have been dominating the front pages of Pagosian's plane not go, gone down. And this, uh, you can see it there, Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, uh, Trump's lawyer, has now been... Um, uh, indicted in Georgia. His mugshot has been taken, but as you can see from the headline there, Sarah, he's saying he's doing it for America. Yes, I mean, that's... Trump is saying a sort of similar thing, isn't he? I mean, it's, it's just sort of... Have you worked out the... Crazy oh, yeah. theatre okay. that seems to be going on. I mean, because I think... I think Trump... It's so really sort of under Trump's umbrella, and although there's those supporters, the, the, the more trouble they seem to get in, the more they love him. So mm. it's like he, he's turned, he, you know, he's this sort of messiah, he's this martyr, he's this, you know, he can do no wrong. So it's, 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 it sort of feels a bit like it's almost making it better for Trump. Well, yeah. every time that he's indicted, he's his, his poll numbers go up and he raises more exactly. money. Exactly, you know, so it's like, and I think the same is probably true of Giuliani. I mean, his supporters. He was mayor of New York. He cleaned up New York. He was very sort of tough and all that kind of. I mean, they, you know, I don't, I don't think they. I think they'll just see him as a sort of hero. It's not a split screen moment. We've obviously got this on one side, and on the other side, you've got the Republican contenders, mm. apart from Trump, taking part in this first Fox News debate. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's so hard to kind of get attention when you're up against Trump. He sucks the oxygen mm. out of everything. And this is going to happen exactly again. You look at all of their poll numbers. They're all going to be standing there at the podiums desperately trying to say anything that might get some attention. Yeah. And you know that all the attention will be on Donald Trump and whatever happens to him tomorrow when he goes to that courthouse. But the fascinating thing is they can't say anything too critical because they don't want to yeah. upset the Trump base. And also, perhaps they want to get on the ticket with him eventually. And, and, and Trump and Giuliani, I mean, it's interesting, they double down, yeah. you know, when, on these court cases. Because you know, over the years, all, all candidates for the presidency claim to be outsiders. They claim to be uh, outsiders to the Washington institutions. Mm -hmm. But these guys are claiming to be outsiders to all of America's institutions. Yeah. You know, the, the whole, this whole Republican base is an attack on all of the institutions of America. They just don't believe in it anymore. And so, in a way, it's, it, what you've got is a sort of political move which says all the institutions which, which oppose us are somehow illegitimate. Yeah. So America is really a very straight, it's dangerous place. Also, to get into. I always think of Giuliani as a sort of almost a precursor to Trump, yeah. because mm. he was doing the Trump shtick yeah. before Trump was doing the Trump shtick. You know, he was the kind of tough guy, the maverick, the, you know, I'm going to, I don't care, I'm not going to put up with any of your namby-pamby nonsense. And he was doing that. And, and, and so, so it sort of feels that that's just, that's his, you know, that's his USP, isn't yeah. it? And so this just plays into it, really, it to be honest. It certainly does. All right. Plenty more on that uh, later on. But let's look at City M, because we haven't got loads of time left. Uh, and this is a, a story that um, has taken a, a turn that I perhaps wasn't <laughs> expecting, but I maybe should have done. Uh, and this is uh, the boss of Nat West, who is, uh, of course, who stood down after that uh, Ferrari with Nigel Farage. Uh, and John, um, she's taking a 2.4 million pound. Mm, <laughs> poor thing. I mean, it must be awful Whoops. for her. <laughs> I think if I ever lose my job and ended up buying <laughs> 2.4 million pounds to pay out, I would be very <laughs> delighted. <laughs> Take me now. Um, but obviously, the reason why it is such a big number is because this is basically 12 months' notice. Mm. When you add in a salary and a mm. pension, you get to this incredible number. But obviously, after what happened and that ridiculous row where she was very embarrassed, leaking that story, and then her explanation didn't add up at all, you think she's done very well to get any money at all. I mean, it just reminds you how much these bankers really get oh, yeah. paid. I mean, they just do get paid stratospheric amounts of money, don't they? And that's it, you and, know. Uh, we're doing the I'm wrong sure, thing. Yeah, well, I'm, sure that yeah. she, I'm sure that she's worth it. <laughs> Professor Clark, John and Sarah, thank you very much. More from you guys in the next hour. Let's uh, take a look at what the weather's going to be doing for the next couple of days.
Well, there will be further showers this week, with more general thundery rain possible in the southeast. Central Britain will have quite a cloudy and in places damp starts tomorrow, while northern Scotland will see showers or longer spells of rain. The muggy south of England can expect a few thunderstorms too. Those thundery downpours will threaten southeast uh, England tomorrow morning, but the extent is a little uncertain. Elsewhere, it will be mainly dry with sunny spells, but there will be showers around as well. They will be prolonged in the north. Cloudier skies mean it will be cooler for much of southern England. Now, the afternoon looks fine for many, with showers over central parts that largely fade away, but they'll keep going in the breezy northwest and the cloudy southeast. The northern Isles can expect more general rain. Friday will bring sunny spells and a scattering of showers to most parts, some heavy with a risk of hail and thunder. The showers will be concentrated in the northwest and well scattered in the southeast. Well, coming up on Sky News at 11, we'll have the latest on that plane crash outside Moscow, a plane that was coming. You've got your Prigozhin.
It is 11 o'clock. This is Sky News' extended news review and press preview, our top story. Evgeny Prigozhin, the man who led a failed coup in Russia, believed to have been involved in a prank crash. The private jet brought down between Moscow and St. Petersburg with Prigozhin named on the passenger list. President Putin busy tonight presenting medals at a military concert while President Biden has hinted at what might have happened to the Wagner leader. I mean, not much that happens when Russia is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. Also tonight, Rudy Giuliani surrenders to authorities in Georgia on charges that he helps Donald Trump try and subvert the 2020 election there. India's successful lunar landing, joy and relief at Mission Controls, the country now plans to send astronauts to the moon. India's successful moon mission is not just India's alone. This success belongs to all of humanity. Well, over the next hour, we'll be discussing today's news with our reviewers, John Stevens from the Daily Mirror and Sarah Vine from the Mail. We'll also be joined for the first part of our programme by Professor Michael Clark, our military analyst. And later, we'll have a full run-through of tomorrow's front pages. Good evening. The man who masterminded an attempted coup against Vladimir Putin has been declared dead by Russian authorities. Evgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the mercenary Wagner Group and a longtime ally of President Putin until the ill-fated march on Moscow in June, was named as a passenger on a private jet which crashed on its way from the Russian capital to St. Petersburg. However, it remains unconfirmed tonight if Prigozhin was actually on board, despite pro-Wagner social media channels proclaiming both the mercenary leader and the Wagner founder, Dmitry Utkin, to have died. Well, coming up, we'll bring you tonight's headlines and tomorrow's front pages and the views of uh, Sky News' defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark, the Daily Mirror's political editor, John Stevens, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. But first, our Moscow correspondent, Diana Magne, reports on today's extraordinary events in Russia. First, there is just a plume of white smoke, and then it is clear it's a plane tumbling out of the sky. Russia's aviation authority says Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin was killed on that plane, a man who, since he set his men on Moscow two months ago, was perhaps Putin's enemy number one, however the Kremlin liked to spin it. He and his number two, Dmitry Utkin, now apparently both come to a sticky end. That's if the Russian authorities are to be believed. <laughs> this moment and the 24 hours preceding it in Rostov-on-Don in June were unforgivable for Vladimir Putin, an act of mutiny by the Wagner leader against Russia's top military command, then calling his men off halfway to the capital in exchange for supposed exile in Belarus. But it didn't seem much like exile. Prigozhin popping up in St. Petersburg, hobnobbing with African dignitaries and continuing to rail against the way the Ukraine war was being run from Belarus. The last we saw of him was this video published earlier in the week, most probably in the African Sahel, where Prigozhin said that Wagner would make Russia even greater and Africa even more free. But his days were likely numbered. It looks as though it may well be... Um, a, re a revenge attack by someone in the elite, possibly somebody very senior, um, on Prigozhin. And in fact, we had heard some weeks ago from a source that a contract had in fact been put out on Prigozhin in Russia by senior members of the business community. As the news broke, President Putin appeared at a commemorative event for the World War II battle at Kursk, holding a minute silence for the Soviet dead as the wreckage of the plane burned. From the US, President Biden had this to say. I don't know for a fact what happened, but I am not surprised. There's not much that happens when Russia is not behind, but I don't know enough to know the answer. No doubt clarity will be a long time coming. But Prigozhin is a man who courts attention. And if he is not dead, then we will likely hear from him soon. And if he is, there will be no tears shed in the Kremlin. Dana Magne, Sky News, Leningrad region, Russia.
All right, let's take a look at how some of tomorrow morning's newspapers are reacting to this news about Prigozhin and the headline in the eye, Putin critic killed 60 days after mutiny. The Guardian says the Wagner chief is reported dead after the crash. The Daily Mail asks whether the crash was an act of revenge by President Putin. The Mirror, Putin's revenge is their headline. While inside the Times page four and five, the paper details the relationship between President Putin and Evgeny Prigozhin. While the Express also suggests the crash was a result of Prigozhin's attempted mutiny, calling what's happened no surprise. All right, let's get the thoughts now of John, Sarah uh, and Michael. And we'll start with uh, looking at the front of the eye, guys, as well. And, you know, it is sort of, I think, symbolic that this may well have happened mm. some two months, almost exactly to the day since that failed mutiny. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. Uh, gone in 60 seconds, gone in 60 days. Is that why they've done that headline, mm. perhaps? But, I mean, but it's... it's you know, this is one of those stories that's going to obviously unfold over the next 24 hours. And I think it's, it, it, it's, I mean, it's dominating all the front pages, obviously. But I don't really think anyone knows what's going on. I mean, most, so many of the papers are sort of,